I'd like to welcome you and also like to thank all of you for attending today's meeting on remining as a domestic critical mineral resource. I'm going to start with an acknowledgement of our lands and then a brief overview of the mission of the National Academy of Sciences and the Board of Earth Sciences and Resources that are sponsoring this meeting. We acknowledge that the National Academies is physically housed on the traditional land of the Nakachank and Acostan and Piscataway peoples, past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the people we have who have stewarded it through the generations. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these peoples and the nations and this land. We thank them for their resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities to their example. So the National Academy and its boards provide a neutral convening body that supports the use of scientific research for evidence-based policymaking and to recruit scientific and technology specialists to participate in advisory work and confront challenging issues for the benefit of society. This neutral convening body provides guidance on programs, program directions and priorities um, so as helps resolve the scientific or science policy controversies, provides technical analysis and independent peer review, informs science policy debates, builds and maintains scientific networks, summarizes the state of the science to audiences of varying technical knowledge, and increases visibility of emerging scientific fields and science policy issues. The Board on Earth Sciences and Resources is the focal point for activities and issues relevant to solid earth sciences and resources. We cover a broad topical space, including a range of geologic hazards, energy and mineral resources and stewardship, geographic, geologic, and geospatial mapping and modeling, technical engineering, carbon sequestration and the energy transition, as you'll hear today, strategic directions for earth science research, intersection of geology and health, environmental justice, equity in earth sciences, and education, workforce development, and safety. The board is composed of a disciplinary diverse group of experts from across the US that you see here. And I invite you to look through the agenda booklet for the members bios. And Dr. Deborah Glickson is the director of the board. I'm gonna now pass the screen to uh, my colleague, Jim Slutz. Okay, good morning. I think I got my meetings. Um, thank you, Isabel, and uh, welcome to everyone that is joining us today uh, for this meeting of the Board on Earth Science and Resources. I, uh, we thought it would be useful just to ha share a little bit of background on the critical minerals topic and what some of the, how it's evolved recently with work of the National Academies. So um, just, just wanted to highlight a few recent act, uh, uh, activities. First, a uh, two, and, and these, these uh, information on these are all available on the National Academy's website. So first, uh, more recently, the, the first item is a 2008 report uh, on critical minerals, and that was focused on the traditional use of minerals in industry. And uh, just as a little note, the executive son, son, um, uh, summary doesn't mention uh, electric vehicles or, and it doesn't mention vehicles or other energy applications. In 2018, so 10 years after that, uh, the Committee on Earth Resources, which is part of the, the board, uh, convened a meeting on, uh, on critical minerals and folk, that meeting focused on mineral demand and, uh, and application and also on US mineral endowment and the opportunity of that endowment. Um, it did, uh, did look very carefully at some of the uh, supply chain issues and concerns, but I would describe it as not having a real sense of urgency. And uh, one, one uh, thing that happened about that same time frame that, 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 uh, that we'd like to think that 
that we helped encourage was there was significant funding for the US Geological Survey to uh, to enhance the uh, geologic mapping programs with a focus on on understanding the US um, critical mineral endowment. And then in 2021, uh, the Committee on Earth Resources convened a series on uh, the energy transition, which was very focused on critical minerals. And to give you a sense, when we did the one in 2018, we probably had a few dozens of people participate. The, uh, the one in 2021, we had hundreds of people, and it has been... Uh, We've heard from a number of sources. It's been used, for instance, at universities and others to uh, uh, to advance the understanding. So I think the way I would characterize the progression from 2008 to 2018, that 10 year period, we kind of went from appreciating critical minerals from a, a key component of manufacturing to to minerals that are essential and strategic for the energy transition. And then over the last, those four years from 2018 to present, I, I think the real sense of urgency and being, and also beginning to understand the scale of the challenge. And so as we get underway with this, let me just share a couple of thoughts on that challenge and the timeline and the scale. When we look at many of the milestones we're hoping to achieve in energy transition, it's many times those are those are presented in and I, I read a book where it said we have to stop just looking at even at 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 at, uh, at at years end in zero and five. And so so a quick reminder that uh, 2030 is seven years from now. 2035 is 12 years from now. In 2050 is 27 years from now. Now, boy, that sounds like a long time. So let's look at each of those real quickly. So a new may so for example, with a couple examples, a new major energy facility beginning planning today will become operation after operational after 2030, assuming there are no problems with permitting. The average global time, according to the IEA, International Energy Agency, to bring a new mine from discovery to operation is 16 years. And if, e if electric vehicles penetrate the market in the same way that internal combustion engines replaced horses, it would require two capital cycles or 33 years for, for the majority of vehicles to become EVs. And I share these thoughts not to be pessimistic, but to highlight the challenge we face and to emphasize the need to address important issues that will enable the development of minerals. These minerals are essential to allow the market to develop products and options for a lower emission future. And also, it, um, I think it's important to note just how short the time frame is these from when we've changed how we think about these minerals. So, so it's just been the last few years that we've realized the, the challenge and uh, of those. So uh, with that little intro, let me, let me uh, transition into our meeting today. Um, so today's meeting, we're focused on, um, on, on the opportunity for expanding our critical mineral production from uh, previously mined and abandoned mine sites uh, that uh, for a variety of reasons, these when those mines were, were implemented, they, uh, the, these minerals that are potentially there were not, not the primary focus or not didn't have the economic potential uh, to be developed. So, um, so we want to we want to explore uh, uh, a bit about those uh, opportunities, but and and there are a number of environmental challenges, but there's also potential benefits of 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 remining and cleaning up and and changing what potentially was a uh, uh, was a uh, was a very negative outcome to something positive. So today we're gonna we're gonna we're organized around three panels for this meeting. We're gonna look first at supply and demand, and and that'll be the the first uh, panel. And we have a number of speakers exploring different uh, uh, 
areas of that. Uh, we're going to then move into a panel that, that will look at the impacts of mining and, and how, to, how to mitigate those impact and achieve positive outcomes. And then our, our third panel, we're going to, um, uh, there, there, are a lot, there are a number of policy challenges around remining. And so we want to explore those and figure out how do we, how do we get to those and how do we uh, make a concerted effort to manage uh, these, these impacts, but, but get through some of that, those challenges and uh, in a reasonable period of time so we can make a difference to accomplish what we need to uh, in terms of the energy transition. So I do want to, before we launch into this meeting, uh, share with you that that in, in two weeks, uh, approximately two weeks, we uh, uh, the Committee on Earth Resources that I chair will be having a second, having a meeting on, on critical minerals on the future of mining. And so while this meeting is focused on remining, that meeting will is focused on, on new mining, new technology, uh, but also looking at some of those social license, social impact issues, and how do we work through those challenges as well? Because as we discussed with the timeline, we, we really have to solve these issues of, uh, and, and we're going to dive into some of those coming up uh, to, to highlight those, but if we can't solve these issues, uh, it's going to be very challenging uh, to meet the low emissions goals that we wish to meet in the future. So one quick note uh, also related to mining is uh, I, I just wanted to highlight this for those that may be uh, of a new report that was issued yesterday from the National Academies that, that, that was under, under this board and the Committee on Earth Resources is the potential impacts of gold mining in Virginia. And there's a, a QR code on this slide. And if you're interested in, in downloading this, uh, this report, it is available now, so we'll we won't we'll uh, look at that. Uh, that that's uh, there. There will be opportunities to learn more about that in the future if you're interested in the reports available. And finally, as we as we get ready to uh, to get underway with this meeting, uh, for those of you online, there's um, the there the platform is called Slido, and you can. There's, there's a QR code for joining, but there's also a, a mechanism within that that you, you can ask a question. We encourage you to do that. In fact, it is uh, the, uh, the National Academies. We consider all of the participants as, as part, of the, part of the meeting and the richness of our meeting relies on that engagement. So we'll look forward to your uh, questions and, um, uh, and and as we get into the discussion part of the meeting. And with that, let me, uh, we're going to transition to our first panel. And first, let me, let me, uh, I, I just want to review for the, our panelists, the, uh, the order is, it, we, we agreed to to do an order that's slightly different and what's showing on, showing on the uh, agenda. So Frank will be first, uh, Nadal will be second, then Jennifer, then Abby. But let me, let me start by, by noting that the detailed uh, uh, bios for our speakers are on the website and in the program. And, and in the interest of preserving as much time as possible for the presentations and discussions, we'll do very brief introductions uh, of the speakers uh, for purposes of, uh, of today. So, so with that, I'm gonna, we'll, we'll get kicked off here and let me, let me start by introducing Frank Hoffman. 
He is a consulting principal on the on economics and country risk team at S and P Global Market Intelligence. So, so Frank's going to kick us off, and I think he's going to mostly talk about copper. But uh, look forward to your comments here, Frank. Great. Can everyone hear me and see my screen okay? All right. Well, uh, thanks, Jim, for the introduction, and good morning, everyone. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here today to kick off conversation. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to talk about the future of oh, copper. Frank, Frank really we don't. Attention. Is he on now? Yeah. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Yes. Oh, okay. Great. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm excited to talk about the future of copper study that we released in July. And uh, I know I don't have a whole, whole lot of time, so I'll provide somewhat of a, a high level overview, but really the, the motivation behind our work is the, the public dialogue and discussion around uh, really whether net zero emissions by 2050 uh, is attainable. And you know, more recently over the last two or, or three years, organizations like the IEA, IMF and, and World Bank have begun to, to sound the alarms that, uh, that, that it in fact might not be um, um, achievable uh, by, by 2050, and in particular from uh, a mineral standpoint. And the you know, discussion and discourse you know, typically centers around minerals like lithium, cobalt, uh, maybe nickel to a little bit lesser degree, given their, their importance as battery metals, and, and rightfully so. But what's often missing from the, uh, the conversation is copper, which is obviously used for a myriad of, of different end uses. But when you, you think about the, the energy transition, uh, what that means in, in really many cases is electrification. And quite simply, given its conductivity properties, Copper is the metal of, electric, of electrification. So in our study, we, we do a real deep dive um, using a bottoms up approach going technology by technology of these new energy transition related um, and markets of demand. And we do, when we do that, we size out the copper requirements of the energy transition. What we then did was, was couple that with our, our projections for uh, demand from traditional copper and markets. And when we put that together, uh, we see that copper demand uh, will roughly double by 2035 and continue to grow through 2050. When we compare these projections against uh, what could happen with supply, the mismatches between demand and supply are, are stark. Uh, we put forth two different scenarios and in our, in our very ambitious high ambition scenario, which includes heroic assumptions regarding mine capacity utilization and recycling, even then uh, we, we expect a mismatch between demand and supply uh, beginning in uh, just a few years in 2025 and lasting through most of the 2030s. And it could get even worse when you consider the, the different operational challenges that impact the mining and refining of copper, um, which, which we discussed so in, in our study. So that there, we really you know, see and, and highlight a, a sense of urgency here. So our, our multi-tech mitigation scenario really um, drives the assumptions uh, regarding an energy transition uh, related copper demand. And as you can see on the, the chart on the left, it's, it's quite similar to the IEA net zero by 2050 scenario. Um, it, it's a bit different in that our, our multi-tech mitigation case is, is a bit more nonlinear. And, and that's because we're of the opinion that, you know, given the, the infrastructure uh, that, that would be needed to really build out um, technologies that will enable the energy transition, um, will really limit uh, how much uh, uh, emission uh, can be reduced in the near term. But once that really starts to get going, uh, it'll start to, um, it'll start to, uh, it'll start to come down at, a, um, at an accelerated rate. 
and these are aligned with some of the, the U.S. decarbonization goals that the, the Biden administration um, has put forth. As things stand, uh, roughly 8 million metric tons of, of copper are used globally uh, for energy transition related uh, and markets uh, with the transmission and distribution and automotive and charging uh, and, and markets being the, the, the biggest components. By 2035, we expect this to, to more than double to uh, roughly 21 million metric tons. So roughly a 1.5, 1.6x increase. Uh, by 2035, we expect that given increased EV penetration, uh, automotive and charging will be the largest end market um, within the, the energy transition related uh, uses. But technologies uh, from renewables like solar, wind, and battery storage uh, will start to uh, increase quite a bit as well. And in particular, uh, wind, both onshore and offshore, and, and battery storage. Um, we, we expect to have the, the, the highest growth rates uh, alongside automotive and charging um, in, in terms of, uh, of increase in, in copper demand. And when we fold this into our, our, our um, overall um, demand for, for copper, we see a, a rough doubling from about 25 million metric tons today to 49 million metric tons in 2035. Thereafter, uh, growth will, uh, or, or demand will, will stay flat for a little bit and then continue to grow uh, to, to around 40, 53 million metric tons by 2050. So this is, is, a, is a pretty big and, and quick increase in overall copper usage. And, it really begs the question, what does this all mean for supply? And will supply be able to grow um, fast enough to, to meet these demand ambitions? And to answer the, those questions, we, we put forth two different supply scenarios that we've dubbed Rocky Road and High Ambition. Now, both these scenarios use the same mine capacity forecast, but really how they differ is the pulling of two key levers which is the mine capacity utilization rate or mined output um, as a percentage of, uh, of uh, annual rated capacity and the recycling rate or the uh, percentage of total refined uh, copper production that, that is from recycled uh, material. And you can think of Rocky Road as, as somewhat of a status quo scenario in that recent trends in utilization and, and recycling rates will continue through 2050. That is the average over the last 10 years is projected out um, through, through 2050. So that's really what, what, that, what Rocky Road means in a, in a you know, technical and descriptive term. Um, a, a bit more thematically, how you can think of it is that a lot of the operational challenges that, that really plague the supply side of the industry, like declining ore grades, um, labor issues, ESG concerns, water access, um, will continue to be issues and actually intensify going forward. And that even though there will be strong incentives to increase recycling and, and improve efficiency, uh, given this, this uh, swelling of demand, that these operational challenges will intensify to the, to the, to the extent that that will limit uh, some of these potential effic uh, efficiencies and ultimately that limits supply growth, um, which widens the gap between, supply, uh, between demand and supply, creating a rocky road for the industry. Now, the high ambition scenario, on the other hand, uh, we use, uh, we use all-time highs in uh, mine capacity utilization uh, at the country level in terms of uh, how high utilization goes, um, and then also how long uh, uh, different countries are able to uh, keep, keep utilization at, at high levels. And in recycling, we actually have this increasing to historic highs because even though the energy transition uh, represents different uh, new sources of demand for copper, that also acts as new sources of supply vis-a-vis -vis recycling. 
And when we do this, you can see that both uh, primary production or the refining of mined copper and secondary production, the refining of, of uh, recycled copper is higher in, uh, under high ambition uh, than in Rocky Road. And in particular, uh, towards the, the outer years of our forecast uh, from 2035 uh, on through 2050, it's really the, this new source of recycling from energy transition uh, uh, um, related uh, copper demand that's, that's driving this. And it kind of makes sense given that, uh, that, that peak EV uh, uh, demand really goes through 2035. And, uh, and, 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 it, and it has a lagged effect um, that you know, 15, 20 years later, that starts to return to the, the market um, in, in terms of recycling and scrap. What this ultimately, uh, you know, how, how supply and demand ultimately reconcile, um, again, in high ambition, we, uh, we see demand outpacing supply uh, beginning in just a few years and lasting through most of the 2030s before the market balances out because of the, this, this increased recycling thereafter. But under Rocky Road, uh, once that, uh, this also includes a demand outpacing supply uh, beginning in just a few years, but lasting through our entire forecast horizon through 2050. But 2035 is, is really the peak imbalance between supply and demand. Now, to put this in a bit of a historical context, um, the largest um, shortfall um, of, of supply was in 2004 and was about, uh, about two and a half percent of total, um, total demand. Under high ambitions in 2035 alone, this will be the largest ever single year of a mismatch between uh, supply and demand. But keep in mind, this is really a chronic series of, of, of mismatch of, of, of demand outpacing supply, which would really be catastrophic for the industry. Under Rocky Road, this changes the scale, not just of the situation, but literally of the graph uh, with a, a, a shortfall of almost 10 million metric tons in, in 2035 alone, uh, representing a, a, a shortfall of about 20% of total demand. And what this means for the U.S. is that there will be a, a greater, a, a higher reliance on uh, imports to meet demand. So between 1995 and 2021, uh, so the supply of copper within the U.S. Um, or production has, has fallen, as has as has demand, but production has fallen quicker, and. In 1995, the U.S. just relied on imports for, for 10% of total copper demand. That's risen to 44% in, 2020, in 2021. And looking ahead, uh, regardless of scenario, uh, we expect that the U.S. will be reliant on imports uh, for over half of, of, uh, of American copper demand. And we, we, we show this chart for the U.S., but you can think of it being the case for a number of, of other countries as well, which I think could create a, a really a rivalry but between, uh, but between countries for, um, for, uh, for, for supply. And finally, uh, but I, I turn it over for, for questions and then the next panelist. Uh, we examined some of the operational challenges that really plague the supply side of the industry. Um, and, and these are just you know, the, the, the eight primary ones that we, uh, that, that, that we highlight. Uh, permitting is, is obviously, I think, a, a big issue, um, as is uh, social license, which you can, you can consider really encompassing uh, a number of, of, of these different challenges. And again, I think it, it bears reiterating that um, that these challenges act as a downside risk for supply growth um, and could, could create um, an even bigger uh, mismatch between um, our demand ambitions and the supply of, of copper that, that can actually be uh, delivered, which uh, would create 
an even rockier road for the industry. Um, and, and with that, I'll, I'll pause there um, for, for maybe a question or two. Thank you, Frank, for that super overview of, of the report. Um, I'll, um, let's, let me just do a quick time check. I think what we would like to do largely is, is have all the speakers and then come back around to more of a dis question discussion. So, so Frank, we'll, we'll kind of, I think we'll transition to other speakers, then come back around because I think what we'd like to do is explore the interplay between all these issues. Sounds great. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Uh, okay. So, so uh, uh, again, Frank, thank you. And now we'll move uh, to Nadal Nasser. Nadal is with the United States Geological Survey, and he's the uh, Material Flow Analysis Section Chief. And uh, Nadal, you're not a stranger to this topic or to this group or to the Committee on Earth Resources. I think you've maybe spoken at most of our, our Critical Minerals events, and we look forward to your comments here. So welcome this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm very glad to be back. I'm excited to, to share with you some of the research that we're doing at the National Minerals Information Center regarding critical mineral uh, supply and demand. So I think I'm, I'm going to continue um, on the on the thread that that Frank started on looking at the demand side um, and and expand beyond looking beyond copper and then um, quickly switch to looking at supply potential uh, from various waste streams um, I think you know what, what we're really talking about is, is figures that look like this right so this is from the US Energy Inf Information Administration uh, looking at world uh, electricity generation uh, and storage capacity installation up to 2050, um, and and here what you see is what what, what a lot of uh, pr uh, folks are projecting are um, technologies like solar and wind really taking off. Battery storage. Uh, this is just for uh, electricity uh, battery storage, not for vehicles. Uh, also taking off, um, and of course, vehicles taking off even faster, and the question is, how does this impact mineral resources and 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 uh, will it come online fast enough? Um, and if we look at the periodic table for just three technologies, so if we look at solar, uh, these are some of the mineral commodities or the elements that are um, used in various um, solar technologies. Of course, copper is there, silver is there for conductivity, a few of the, the minor metals that are typically produced as byproducts uh, for various thin film technologies. If we look at wind, we're adding, of course, copper, but uh, we have copper, but we're adding some of the alloying elements and for offshore wind uh, there's of course the rare earth permanent magnets uh, neodymium praseodymium and a little bit of the heavies and if we look at vehicle uh, batteries of course we're adding lithium uh, graphite anodes nickel uh, cobalt and manganese for for some of the cathodes in those batteries depending on the specific chemistry um, of course this is not a comprehensive list but you can already see there's quite a bit of, of overlap um, between the different technologies. And as was mentioned by Frank, um, the United States um, was a major producer for, for many of these commodities, but has become increasingly uh, import reliant for, for, for these technologies. And this is a figure that we put in our annual mineral commodity summaries that comes out at the end of January each year, looking at the US import reliance these figures are for 2021. And if we just look at those commodities that I pointed out for those three technologies, we see that they're really um, you know, spread throughout, but many of which are uh, the US is, is highly net import reliant. Now it's important to note here, when we look at net import reliance, traditionally we're talking about uh, import reliance for the raw material forms, right? So ores, concentrates, metals, uh, oxides, and other chemicals. But it's also important to realize that the United States also imports uh, these mineral commodities embedded in semi-finished and finished goods, a study that um, we have coming out shortly in a journal looking at the direct and then the embedded U.S. demand for rare earth elements uh, for, and, and here they're separated out between the lights and some of the heavies. Uh, you can see, especially for the, the ones that go in permanent magnets, um, we import a lot of that material embedded either in, in finished or semi-finished form and not necessarily directly as the raw material. So that's, I think, really important to keep in mind that um, 
a lot of our manufacturing is, has gone overseas, um, meaning we're now importing finished goods rather than manufacturing them ourselves. But if we are to move manufacturing back or to establish large manufacturing back in the United States, we'll be importing more of the raw materials. Now, I want to focus in on one technology, specifically solar photovoltaics. And under that, there are several different um, sub-technologies, right? So the dominant one is crystal and silicon that requires, besides silicon, of course, uh, silver. There's uh, amorphous silicon, there's CAD tells, there's SIGs, and there are other different kinds of solar PV technologies. In the United States, um, second after crystal and silicon is CAD tell. Uh, it's an important um, thin film solar technology that's made headway comprising about 20 to 24% of uh, installed capacity each year. And of course, tellurium is, is a commodity of, of, of concern there. Um, so if we look at how much tellurium might be uh, available or how much uh, of the solar PV uh, capacity might be cad uh, we do a really quick analysis looking at those EIA projections for how much uh, solar needs to be added. We look at how much needs to be replaced depending on whether it's gonna last 20 years or 30 years. And so that's the replacement. And then we translate that into based on current tellurium uh, projections or uh, current uh, tellurium production, how much of this solar PV can be made out of CAD tells. And if you look at those numbers right now, it could be about five, 6% depending on the material intensity of, of the cadmium telluride, but it's gonna go down significantly unless we increase tellurium production. And so the question that uh, colleagues and I have had was, well, could we increase tellurium production? Now, tellurium, like many of these minor metals, are produced mainly or only as byproducts. And, and tellurium specifically is produced uh, as a byproduct of copper electrolytic refining. And so we gather data regarding uh, copper cathode production by refinery to try to understand, well, how much tellurium is being uh, discarded in the copper anode slimes and to estimate what is the potential availability in, in various waste streams. And so back in 2018, there's something on the order of 20 million metric tons of copper cathode coming from primary sources. And you can see a lot of it is coming in from, from China where we have limited visibility. And so given the, the high degree of uncertainty and the lack of visibility in some countries, we gathered as much data as we had. This, is, this is figure is showing a distribution of tellurium content in the anode slimes. And you can see the concentrations are relatively high one, 2% tellurium in those anode slimes. Um, but realizing the high level of uncertainty, we decided to run a Monte Carlo simulation to see what the results would be. And the figure on the right shows the uh, tellurium content of the anode slimes in 2018. We did it for several years. Uh, but just to give you a context of what these numbers mean, uh, current production is on the order of five to 600. The potential that's in the anode slimes is on the order of 2,000. So we're trip, at least tripling, maybe even quadrupling the current amount of production that's there. So a significant amount of tellurium is currently not recovered from the anode slimes. Maybe a third is recovered. And if we look across the supply chain, um, going from right to left, we're producing about 500 tons of tellurium. We're losing about a third of it, uh, not being recovered from the slimes but we're losing even more upstream, right? So we're losing quite a bit of it during the, the smelting, uh, the conversion and the anode furnace, and we're losing uh, the vast majority of it actually right, right at the gate at the, at the mining, uh, milling and froth flotation going out with the tailings. So only about 10% of the tellurium contained in the ores is actually making it uh, to the smelter. And 90% and is actually being lost, plus or minus, is being lost at the, at the tailings, to tailings. And so that's significant. Um, and the overall recovery rate is something on the order of one to 2% of what is physically there is actually currently being recovered. So this information is helpful, but quantities by themselves um, you know, don't tell the full story. So what we can look at is uh, annual flows uh, on the horizontal axis on a log scale versus the concentration of how much, you know, the concentration of tellurium in those flows on the horizontal, act, on the vertical axis, again, on a log to log scale. So we're talking really here about, you know, in, in parts per million. So a few parts per million in the ore, uh, you know, in terms of when it gets to the slimes, we're talking about a few percentages, one to 2%. Uh, 
uh, in the cathodes, of course, very little, because that's the point. You want to get the tellurium out of the cathodes, you know, fractions. Um, and when we get up to the high purity uh, tellurium, you're really talking about very, you know, high, uh, high purity tellurium up here. Um, and so you can use this as a guide as to where it could be potentially recoverable. Um, what you can see for the tailings, of course, is that it's, it's very low concentration. So even though the flows are very large, the concentrations are, are very low. And that's, um, of course, um, makes the recovery, uh, both technical and economic, quite uh, problematic or difficult. So this study was for tellurium. Uh, it was uh, conducted by myself, Michael Motes from Missouri s and um, Sarah Hayes also at USGS, um, and Max Frenzel at, from Freiburg in Germany. And, and Heon Kim also with us at USGS. Uh, some other research looked at some other byproducts, including gallium, indium, and germanium. Now, gallium is produced as a, as a byproduct of, of bauxite. And here, what I'm plotting are some results from Max Frenzel's group in Germany, looking at the reported gallium to bauxite production ratio, again, in, in times 10 to the 6, so PPM, versus what's uh, the content, reported content distribution in the ores. And so you can see we're several orders of magnitude away, suggesting that there's quite a bit of gallium that is not recovered at all from, from bauxite. Similarly, here's a, a figure for indium from, from uh, ratio to zinc. Um, and you can see still lower than what's there, but quite a bit closer to what the contents are uh, in, in terms of the, the zinc concentrates. And if we plot uh, that along with, with germanium's numbers, the horizontal axis is showing annual recovery potential relative to current production. So you could potentially double or triple indium production, just looking at the, at the current flows, germanium, gallium, even more, maybe tenfold increase. Versus if we look at the area underneath the curves on the left and sum it all up across time, we can see what cumulatively has been discarded to, to waste piles uh, during uh, primary production relative to current production, right? So we see we have maybe uh, 100, times 80 times more indium in waste piles that have been discarded and sometime over the last 40 years um, relative to current production gallium is on the order of a uh, thousand times uh, current production that's been discarded so the the volumes are again very very large the question of course remains where are these losses occurring what concentrations are they technical are they economic to recover um, I'll end with one additional uh, plug here for, for a study that we did recently in collaboration with Apple Inc, uh, looking at uh, mine waste, right? So um, one thing that Apple was very interested in was to understand well, for every kilogram or gram of, of copper or gold or, or whatever commodity that they're putting into their products, how much ore and waste had to be mined to recover that. Um, so this rock to metal ratio, and we did it on an asset by asset level. Um, now, of course, what this could be useful for is we got to get to, to analyze this data or to get this, these results, we needed to get asset level information regarding grades, recovery rates, and the waste or ratios or stripping ratios. So this information at the asset level is very useful to be able to then uh, inform things regarding uh, how much is, is being lost to tailings, how much is being lost uh, in, in various um, locations and waste streams. Um, and so let me, let me summarize really quickly. So we know the United States is highly net import reliant for a large and growing number of mineral commodities that are essential for emerging technologies. Much of this demand currently is in, in finished goods uh, for these uh, minor metals. But if we are moving towards a larger domestic manufacturing base, especially for things like EV and solar, we're gonna be require more raw material supplies. There's a significant potential to increase byproduct mineral commodity supplies from current um, production streams. Um, there's large, even larger volumes that have been discarded over time. How much uh, there is can be calculated on a rough order of magnitude, but the concentrations are typically going to be very low. So the economics of processing these waste streams will likely depend on the value of, of the main commodity to make it economic, or perhaps there are some, going to be some non-economic factors that, that make a company uh, or a government decide to go after some of these materials. Finally, I think it's really important to understand where these losses are occurring. Are they occurring to, uh, are, the, are the losses occurring to tailings or are they going to slag or to dust or to the anode slimes? Which countries are they occurring in? Is there a potential economic value? What is the cost to recover of these, these materials? And, and finally, I, I believe some of the recent work that's out there in the literature really can help to start filling some of these, these knowledge gaps to help prioritize which waste streams have the greatest potential. 
I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Nadal. We'll look forward to exploring a bit more of this in our discussion and QA. I, I have uh, I have a couple of questions. I'm sure there's questions around the the uh, the committee and the and our other participants. Okay, our next uh, speaker is uh, Jennifer Dunn. Jennifer is the associate professor of chemical and biological engineering at Northwestern University. So let me uh, let me turn it over to Jennifer. Hi, uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to be here today and to do a lot of learning myself. Very um, interesting to hear the previous speakers on the panel. Um, I'm gonna speak a little bit uh, specifically about some things that we've been talking about just in terms of critical minerals and their centrality to decarbonization uh, through energy storage, particularly in the vehicle sector. And, um, Okay, um, so we've been thinking about this in our group in the context of the Inflation Reduction Act, um, which you know, our, we were uh, led off for this panel by a discussion of some of the challenging timeframes around achieving or moving towards our decarbonization targets. And some of the targets in the Inflation Reduction Act are indeed very, very aggressive. Uh, so within five years um, for uh, an electric vehicle to be tax credit eligible, 80% of the market value of critical minerals and the batteries that they contain uh, need to be extracted or processed here in the US or at one of our 20 free trade agreement countries. And recycling uh, in North America is also a viable source of these minerals for the, uh, for the IRA. So when this um, policy emerged, we, we sat down and, and tried to think about could we meet this target? And of course, there are many complicating factors. It depends on the demand for EVs. It uh, depends on changes in how we mine for these minerals, as we're discussing today. But based on the snapshot that we had at the time when this policy emerged, we, we sat down and did um, an analysis that's currently under review. Um, and, and we determined that it would be challenging to, to meet this target. Um, so we looked at three different battery chemistries. It's also been mentioned that the, the impact and what is mined and what quantities also depends on how the dominant chemistries evolve for lithium ion batteries. But we, look, we looked at three, uh, nickel magnesium cobalt, nickel cobalt aluminum, and lithium iron phosphate. And based on uh, the data that we had, which uh, derived entirely from the USGS, uh, only the lithium iron phosphate batteries could be produced to, to meet the demand. And we looked at these one at a time. Again, so a pretty like, straightforward analysis, but really just trying to get at this question of like, how hard will it be? Um, and, and we looked, we dug into some metals in particular, and we came away with uh, lithium, cobalt, graphite, and manganese potentially being not sufficient to meet demand. We focused on minerals that were defined uh, by the USGS as, as critical. Um, so we, for example, this analysis did not include copper, which was so robustly addressed by the first speaker. Um, so suffice to say that this will be challenging. Um, and we're going to see, as we've been talking about here, the supply chain for minerals evolve in response to this policy and others um, in other nations and regions that are similarly pursuing um, electrification. In my group, we work on using life cycle assessment as a way to quantify the environmental effects of many different technologies, but lithium ion batteries and electric vehicles that contain them as one of, of these technologies. And we've been really interested in how we can fully quantify the environmental effects of these supply chains, uh, both what we have today and then as we think about other alternatives like remining here in the US, uh, we want to be able to do that quite robustly as well. And it's, it's important to quantify the effects of the current supply chain so that we can compare um, against uh, how those would, would change and hopefully be, be lower if we were to increase uh, remining here in the US. So we've been working uh, with different data sets and looking to collect some of our own data to try and quantify some of these effects. Um, and I'll say that we work in both environmental life cycle assessment and social life cycle assessments. Uh, environmental life cycle assessment will give you metrics like greenhouse gas emissions uh, emitted per kilowatt hour of energy storage that's now available. We can look at water consumption, um, but typically life cycle assessments tend to focus on, on those uh, effects, GHG emissions, water consumption, also um, 
energy consumption, of course, because we're concerned about energy storage. Um, but we thought, you know, we, we're aware that there are many other environmental effects of mining. We want to incorporate these holistically in our analyses. Um, and so, you know, for example, uh, the case of cobalt often arises, um, and this has been true in the popular literature as well around consumer electronics um, beyond lithium ion batteries and cars. Um, so in our group, we're, we're working to understand how can we best capture the social and environmental effects of our mineral supply chain, including in countries like the Democratic Republic of the Congo, so that we can uh, use these analyses to help guide energy storage material selection um, and, and overall move to reduce the effects of, of decarbonization. While we want to address climate change, we don't want to create other problems uh, in doing that to the extent that we can avoid those problems. But recently, we've turned to the Environmental Justice Atlas to help us quantify, well, really not quantify, identify the uh, environmental and social effects that arise in minerals mining globally. Uh, the EJ Atlas documents EJ cases um, around the world in a number of different sectors, so it's not limited to mining. But we collected data from this atlas for cases that pertain to minerals mining of minerals identified as critical. Um, and uh, so in these cases, we can find information, and this is all qualitative information, about uh, environmental effects and social effects of minerals mining. So just to give you a sense for what's in this atlas, uh, this is a case from uh, copper mining in Brazil. And uh, the EJ Atlas case will list the different environmental effects. Um, and it goes, of course, well beyond greenhouse gas emissions uh, increases, which are not necessarily, you know, noticed uh, directly from a single operation by a community, what the community is going to notice is how their local environment is changing through things like deforestation, for example, also biodiversity loss. Uh, the EJ Atlas will also report health impacts and social economic impact. So what we're looking to do with this atlas is to develop a comprehensive list of indicators for both environmental and social life cycle assessment that should be addressed to um, capture these effects holistically. And you can imagine also thinking about them then in advance for uh, remining activities or, or fresh mining activities here in the United States. So I'm going to show you some of our preliminary results for which environmental effects are showing up uh, with the greatest frequency. This is by metal. Uh, we also have these uh, tallied out by country, um, but I, I wanted to present them by, by mineral today. I, I see a chat and I hope it's nothing like you can't hear me talking. <laughs> so if there's a problem, please just let me know. Um, so the primary indicators that have arisen are listed here, and we've grouped them uh, by uh, medium, so water, air, and land, and then biodiversity. And if you start from the bottom, you see that the various water indicators that arise, and they pertain to water supply, water quality. Uh, moving on to land, which are the, the middle-ish indicators here, uh, we see things like pollution and deforestation of land. And I skipped over the, the air quality indicators, but of course, mining activities um, release dust. And so that can be an issue as well. And then uh, the, at the top, we see the, the biodiversity related indicators uh, can be as high as 30% you know, frequency for minerals like potassium. It's also relatively high for lithium. Um, so these are our effects that life cycle assessments of minerals mining should address, whether we're looking at minerals acquisition from abroad or at home. Uh, we also took a look at social indicators, um, and these we grouped into categories of land and culture, health, and labor. Uh, the labor indicators are the blue ones that sort of push down from the top, so very dominant indicators there, um, as well as the land and culture related indicators pushing up from the bottom in the green, uh, where we see things like uh, land disposition and um, loss of cultural heritage. So these are, I'm sorry, the uh, labor indicators at the bottom the land and cultural indicators are in the blue at the top, and those can be indeed quite dominant. Uh, so these are issues to consider. Here in the US, of course, many of our mineral deposits are on indigenous lands, um, and this has been addressed um, again and in the popular press. So this is not uh, like anything hidden, but it's just something that as we've talked about, can slow down uh, the, the need to address those indigenous rights and make sure communities are um, on board with activities that are going on. Um, this takes time, basically, and that needs to be accounted for as we think about our decarbonization goals. So the environmental metrics can be relatively um, if you, if you had the time and resources, you could put uh, sensors and, and whatnot to measure air and water 
quality, the social indicators are much more difficult to get at. Um, I'm an engineer and it's especially difficult for me. Uh, so I've been working with uh, social scientists, including an anthropologist here to develop um, recommendations for data acquisition that could inform social life cycle assessment that would be relatively um, straightforward or not straightforward, but perhaps more um, rapid to obtain than doing long and drawn out surveys because of the urgency of this issue. Uh, so we've been talking about things like scales that are more um, rapid to implement than full on surveys, although surveys would remain an important in, uh, instrument to collect information about indicators in social life cycle assessment like child labor. Um, the USGS, of course, is using a lot of remote sensing technology um, to help us better characterize our mineral resource here at home, but you can use remote sensing also to identify loss in farmland that's arisen because of uh, expansion of mining activities, for example, in the DRC. Um, so social life cycle assessment is a really important tool that is a pretty young tool, uh, and so therefore there's a lot of room for improving how we collect data towards it, but I think that placing the social effects right alongside the environmental effects is going to be critical as we look at different ways to assess our routes to obtaining uh, the minerals that we so need for decarbonization. Uh, the United States Geological Survey, of course, uh, is, is really dominant in doing uh, material flow analyses of minerals, um, but I think coupled with social life cycle assessment, environmental life cycle assessment, material flow analysis is also really important to help us understand where we obtain our minerals from and how we might think about increasing their circularity. So our previous speaker from the USGS did an amazing job speaking about MFA. So I'll just mention that we've been looking at graphites. Uh, we do have a heavy dependence here in the US on synthetic graphite, which is made from coal tar pitch and pet coke. So fossil fuels that we're using to sort of help us get to an energy storage based decarbonization strategy, which is very to me very interesting. Um, there are two types of graphite, natural and synthetic. We don't produce any natural graphite here in the US, so we're importing all of that um, to, to use in various applications. But if you note uh, the largest use of graphite in the US now is electrodes. The battery line is extremely thin as we've been talking about. Uh, we might expect that line to grow much, much thicker as we continue to push towards domestic manufacturing of our batteries in particular. So um, I will be interested to see um, in several years how this diagram might change. Um, and for graphite in particular, recycling is a, is a tough road to hoe right now because we do lose a lot of uh, graphite to just dissipation when it's being used. So it's important to keep pushing towards lithium ion battery recycling technologies that can recover the graphite. So I will just conclude uh, by saying, of course, decarbonization is essential and we need to, to keep using life cycle assessment and related tools like material flow analysis to understand how we might expect environmental and social impacts and supplies to evolve as we push towards decarbonization. We're still really at the early stages of this, even though we've been talking about it for a number of years. And so we have an opportunity, uh, as we've been talking about, to use wastes and recycled minerals to the greatest extent possible and to keep pushing towards low environmental impact technologies for extracting minerals. But we need to assess um, these emerging techniques with what we have today and assess them for their social and environmental impacts um, so we can have a handle on, on what we're doing and avoid potentially uh, undesired uh, side effects or consequences. I conclude there and um, stop my share. Jennifer, thank you for that uh, introduction to these this key component. I uh, really great presentation. I have a couple. Uh, again, I think that there's a there's a number of areas where we need to fit that into the conversation, and we will get to that. Um, I'll next. I would like to. Um, Next, I'd like to go to our, our uh, fourth speaker is uh, Abigail Wolf. Uh, Abby is the uh, director of the Center for Critical Mineral Strategy at Securing America's Future Energy. Thank you very much, Jim, and thank you to my other panelists. Um, I think that that was a good setup to what I'm going to be talking about today, which essentially is the national economic security imperative for remining existing mine waste, and also to Jennifer's point, doing it in a way that is environmentally and socially responsible. We see that as being a way to differentiate ourselves in the United States and among like-minded nations and to help reduce a lot of the dangerous concentration that we see in supply chain 
things today. Um, so essentially, yes, the, the point that I would like to get across today is that Remining will be important not just to make sure that we can get responsibly get the materials that we need to meet the forthcoming demand, um, but also to help us regain the social license to operate in the United States and around the world and to reclaim a lot of the um, polluted mine lands that currently exist around the world and in the United States. Um, and it also could help with uh, increasing recycling, as I'll talk about a little bit later, uh, the processing, reprocessing of this mine waste and the recycling of spent material are really two sides of the same coin when it comes down to um, the processes that are needed to extract those particular metals from those particular uh, feedstocks. So, um, Essentially, why are we talking about this today? And the way that we approach it is that, you know, the world is beginning to bet on batteries. Um, electric vehicles in the, since 2018 have more than tripled the amount that are on the roads today. There are more than 16 million electric vehicles on the road. By 2040, Bloomberg projects that over 70% of new vehicles sold will be electric or zero emission vehicles. Um, this is due to not only um, government commitments, um, more right now more than 20 countries and more than 70 cities or subnational governments have committed to 100% zero emission vehicle targets by 2050, but it's also, you know, consumer driven. It's not just top down, it's also bottom up. Um, so here are just a smattering of commitments from the United States and the EU and Canada, but there are other countries who have also committed to these zero emission vehicle targets. Um, in the United States, we've said by 2030, we want at least half of our vehicles to be electric. In the EU and in Canada, they're a bit more ambitious, saying by 2035, 100% of vehicles have to be zero emission vehicles. And the EU actually just stated recently that they are going to ban the sale of internal combustion engine vehicles vehicles by 2035. Um, but again, it's not just governments, it's also companies. There is a huge surge in demand from consumers, whether you are more environmentally conscious, which many are, or quite frankly, fed up with the volatility of prices at the pump right now. We know that oil and gas is an incredibly volatile global market that no matter how much we produce here in the United States, and we are the number one producer of oil in the United States, we consume far more than we produce. And that global reliance on that OPEC manipulated oil market is incredibly, um, uh, it, uh, it's inc it makes us incredibly vulnerable to um, price fluctuations as we're seeing with the war in Ukraine. Um, but so GM has said that they are going to only sell by zero, sell zero emission vehicles by 2035. Ford actually just re-upped its commitment that it's going to only sell electric vehicles in the EU by 2035 and aim to get to 100% by 2040. So really the, the demand side from consumers and companies is also growing. Uh, so what does this mean for our EV supply chains? Um, a typical electric vehicle requires six times the mineral impact inputs as a traditional ICE vehicle. EVs need aluminum and iron for their body and chassis. They need copper for electrical wiring and also in the anode and under current chemistries and Jen Jennifer laid out, you know, the different chemistries, um, but they traditionally need, you know, lithium, cobalt, manganese, nickel, and carbon, which is graphite um, for the anode. They also use a smattering of rare earth elements within their permanent magnets as well. Um, so I'll, you know, take a page out of Nadal's book as well. Um, um, he showed us this chart, but I'll add, you know, a couple key other things to point out. Um, in addition to the United States being more than 50% import reliant for almost every single metal that we need for batteries, um, China and Russia are actually major import sources for 18 of those 30 minerals. Um, but what does that really mean? As Nadal said, you know, only some of that is actually raw material. A lot of it is embedded. And what we're really seeing is that the key choke point is actually more in the midst stream in the processing of that material. You cannot just take a rock and put it into a Tesla. You need to melt it down, use hydrometallurgy, pyrometallurgy, electro winning, something else to make that rock into something that is usable that can go into the guts of the battery, the anode or the cathode. And that is really where we see the key choke point in the critical mineral supply chain. The United States has less than 4% of all minerals processing, and we make zero 
cathodes and anodes in this country, whereas the Chinese Communist Party controls anywhere from 60 to 100 percent of all minerals processing for all of the key metals needed for batteries. And they produce more than 70 percent of the world's cathodes and almost 90 percent of the world's anodes. And so why do we care about this? People say to me, well, who cares? China's going to cut off our supply of cobalt. Uh, you know, what is that going to do to us? And I say, no, China's not going to cut off our supply of cobalt because we do not process cobalt in this country. So why would they cut off our supply of cobalt? Instead, what they would do is say, whether nefariously or not, because let's also keep in mind that they are the largest growing market for electric vehicles, that they could say, you know what, we cannot send you the cathode active material or the raw materials that you need. Um, in fact, we can't send you any batteries because frankly, we need all of those batteries in our country. You have to enter into a lottery to buy an ICE vehicle in China. You get special incentives for purchasing electric vehicles in China. So they'll say, no, sorry, we can't send you batteries, but you know what? We can send you United States. We can send you a car. And why that is a problem is because our automotive industry supports the U.S. economy by contributing more than a trillion dollars to us each year. It contributes more than 5% to our GDP and millions of jobs. They are the backbone of our high-tech manufacturing workforce. We use them as our arsenal for democracy during World War II and our arsenal for health recently during the COVID-19 pandemic. If we allow our auto sector to miss this electrification wave and be hollowed out, it will be disastrous for our economy and our future competitiveness. So I talk a lot about EVs, but EVs really are just the leading indicator as we switch from a fossil fuel based economy to a minerals based economy. A lot of the supply chains, a lot of the technology that we need for EVs are also the technology and supply chains that you're going to need for anything with an on off switch. And we know that our society is becoming more electric, connected and autonomous. So we're going to need more of these things anyway, whether or not you are pro electric vehicle or not. Uh, it's just going to have to happen. So if we cannot afford to miss the EV wave, though, because it will make us laggard in everything else as well. Um, but going back to energy, uh, uh, the war in Ukraine is just putting a really key focus on this. Um, we see the dangerous, the danger that is involved in having overly concentrated supply chains for energy resources, for any resource, um, and being overly reliant on a strategic competitor or somebody who's just outright hostile to, to democracy for that. So we want to make sure that as we transition to that minerals-based economy, that we are not overly reliant on foreign adversaries that do not share our interests and values. So when you actually look at the EV supply chains, and this data is taken from the U.S. Geological Survey 2022 Mineral Commodity Surveys and also from Benchmark Mineral Intelligence to bring in some of the processing um, information, you can see that um, it's actually a bit of a varied landscape when it comes to where we're getting these materials from. You can see that the United States does have some small reserves when it comes to lithium, nickel, and cobalt. Um, I will put an asterisk next to that. Um, I, Nadal may have mentioned this or, or others, but you know, a reserve is a known economically viable quantity. Um, given the market right now, what is economically viable, I'd say shifts from day to day and that, you know, the price for lithium is sky high right now. Um, but also we just haven't had a real history of mapping where these things are in the United States. So I'll also point out that in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the IJA, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, they do include additional funding for the National Cooperative Geologic Mapping Program and the Earth Mapping Resources Initiative within the U.S. Geological Survey to go out and map those tailings piles to try to figure out what do we have in those um, in those piles of existing mine waste that we could go back and remine because we do not have a good idea of what we have available to remine or to mine anew um, right now. Um, but so this also begs the question, you know, you can see again here, China really is most dominant in the processing. They do not control the most reserves for these key metals. They are not the even the top producer for all of these key metals, but they are a top processor. So why aren't we then diversifying these supply chains? If we all recognize that this is the problem, if we all know this is the problem, why aren't we doing anything about it? And frankly, I think it is because it is expensive to do it. Um, we do not have the social license to do it. And when it comes to minerals processing, we quite frankly lack a lot of the expertise that it takes to do that. 
Um, I, I think that, you know, high costs and lack of social license are two of the key things right now. Um, we see that, you know, even though processing is the biggest choke point, you cannot begin to address processing minerals until you have something to process. It costs billions, hundreds of millions to billions of dollars to build a brand new processing facility. Um, you're not going to build one of those processing facilities unless you have something to process at the end of the day. Um, typically, it's mining companies that have been footing the bill to, to build processing facilities. There aren't just, you know, today there are some, but traditionally there have not just been companies that are making all of their money just going around building processing facilities. They have clients and those clients are mines. And so, you know, how do you shift that paradigm then if, if mining in the United States is such a hot potato, permitting is such an issue, and frankly, we don't have all of the reserves in the world to meet the demand for our global auto market and everything else that we, when we operate in a global economy, how do you get other people to pay for minerals processing? Um, and how do you also diversify that supply of where things are coming from? Because China does, even though they do not possess the geological reserves themselves, they have been incredibly strategic in going out and actually um, doing joint ventures, purchasing stakes in mines around the world. They own 15 of the 19 largest cobalt producing mines in the DRC, which as Jennifer pointed out, produces actually like two thirds of the world's cobalt supply. Um, and they're also very dominant in Latin America as well, purchasing up um, lithium joint ventures as well. So we see the way to diversify supply chains as leveling the global playing field and making sure that everybody is mining things with high standards. We think that it is incredibly difficult to diversify those supply chains because it is incredibly expensive to diversify those supply chains. We think, we think it's expensive because where mining is done currently, it, it, they are ostensibly exploiting their workers and degrading their environment. Um, so if we are to truly diversify supply chains to remove the premium that is added on top of responsibly mined material or remined material, then we need to make sure that everybody is operating on a level playing field and adhering to the same um, level of environmental, social, and labor. Uh, standards. We think that this on its own lacks legitimacy and that you need to also layer transparency on top of that to make sure that people are adhering to those rules. And we are currently examining different policy levers. You know, the, there's uh, Dodd-Frank Section 1502, which was sort of the impetus, like the very beginning of thinking about critical minerals and the social effects of it. Um, they, you know, with that, they have the 3TG, tin, tungsten, tailorman, and gold. You, if you are Sony or somebody that uses any of these materials you need to disclose to the SEC, whether those come from a conflict affected region, although that was recently just sort of declawed a little bit in 2017, when the SEC essentially said, if you don't report those things, we're not going to come after you. So um, we need to make sure that we can get some of those transparency mechanisms back in place and also work with our allies around the world to make sure that everybody is adhering to these rules because the United States can't do this alone, especially when you're dealing with a non-market actor like the Chinese Communist Party that is willing to flood the market with low-cost goods. So um, we see remining of waste, I actually go back, we see remining of waste as being really critical to this. It is a way to reclaim land that it has been despoiled in the past. It is a way to regain social license. Um, but one of the key hurdles to getting to that higher playing field and to remining that waste here in the United States is the lack of Good Samaritan legislation that exists. And I'm sure later on in the day, you may hear more about that, but there is currently bipartisan and legislation that has been introduced to make sure that to pilot, just go out and pilot some projects to try to clean up some of these abandoned mine lands and to reprocess that waste. Um, also, as Jennifer mentioned, the IRA places added focus on this. If we need to get at least 40% of the value of our mined or processed mineral material from the United States or an FTA country, going back and reprocessing a lot of that mine waste could be a very easy and quick and efficient and also environmentally and socially responsible way to get that material very quickly so that consumers can get that EV tax credit faster. Um, and also, I would just say that going forward, emphasizing full value mining in the United States. You know, in the past, we've gone out, we've had a copper mine or a zinc mine or a, you know, whatever, whatever mine or an iron mine. And we've been ignoring the other trace elements, you know, that exist within those ore bodies. So if there was a federal level incentive to say, you know, we will help you to, you know, produce, uh, Rio Tinto has been going out. They have, you know, their borate mine that they're going out and remining for lithium. They have a copper mine that they're going out and remining for tellurium. So, you know, and 
emphasizing this full value mining, I think will be incredibly important in the future. Um, I guess I'm going to end there, but uh, thank you so much. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Abby. And thank you to all of our panelists. I think in the interest of time, what I'm going to do is I have a ton of questions and uh, uh, for each of you, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with a little lightning round and ask three questions that somewhat are targeted to individuals, but I'm going to let you guys decide what part of it you want to answer. And so, uh, and so let me, uh, let me start and and, and Frank, I wrote this, I, I, my thought was copper, but this actually applies to the rest of the panel. You can substitute other minerals when I say copper in this question. So if copper or another mineral is a tight supply and we don't have enough of it, then the price will go up. And theoretically, if, if we're 20% short of the demand, there's some part of the demand that doesn't get served. And I think of, you know, we obviously some things could get substituted. We've all, if we've done any home construction or building, we've we've seen how high already we're seeing higher copper prices. And you probably can't change your electrical wiring, but you can use plastic for plumbing and, and things like that. But so so my first question is in a tight supply, what industries don't have enough copper to use? And what what part of the economy suffers? That's question number one. Question two is, and I'm probably going to get, I'll just admit, I'm going to get in trouble for this one a little bit because uh, I've been, uh, having been in the federal government, I sometimes see things go away that maybe shouldn't have. And the, the question is, is regarding, you know, we used to have a Bureau of Mines and we used to have a significant mining research portfolio. And it seems to me there's uh, Nadal referenced a lot of issues around technology and and do we need to revisit kind of a public research component for for mining mining technology? I see some of Nadal your 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 details on how much of products we're leaving behind. I know that's the 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 opportunity possibly in a waste stream. But clearly, how you know, is it a technology or is it an economic or both that we could solve that to have better recovery? And the third one is on these social impacts. And, and is there a good, uh, that, you know, I understand and it gets challenging when you look at social impacts. There's, there's all these different ways. It, it, it's hard to, and, and I think Jennifer, you raised it as an engineer, you're looking at all these issues. Engineering says there's this defined standards, social license issues many times are hard to have defined standards. So, so is there, is there a uh, kind of a, a standard for social responsible mining? And let me take that into to Abby's and, and some of these things then require a broader, a higher cost of development clearly. And how does that impact consumers and consumer acceptance since you really, that's gonna be reflected in end products. So those are questions trying to hit all four of you, but I ask each of you to address whatever component of it you want. And why don't we just, uh, go run through all four of you and have a chance to do whatever you want, do it as succinctly as possible so we can then move on to some questions from our board and, uh, and, uh, and other folks. So um, let me, do uh, you guys wanna, I'll, I'll just in the interest of calling, I'll, I'll go through, have, give you a chance. Frank, I'll start with you again and give you a chance and I'll go Frank, Natal. Nadal and uh, Jennifer and, and Abby, just in that order, so you, so we just can run through it quickly. Yeah, so I'll, I'll start with the you know the first question. I think price is going to be a really important mechanism, uh, you know, in in terms of you know demand, um, and then and also in, I think incentivizing supply, uh, you know, supply additions and capacity additions as well. Um, you know, in in terms of you know what are some industries that the or sectors that might be vulnerable to um, to to kind of demand loss. I think it I think it really kind of comes down to two things: um, the the viability of, of substitution and willingness to pay. So if, you know, for example, for you know, in in terms of copper, 
wire and cable is uh, is I think you know ripe for um, you know substitution to aluminum um, where you know where possible. I think you know that's that, that's a, that's already happened to a degree, and I think it's going to be uh, an increased thing going forward. So obviously things like subsea cables and then you know wiring. Um, you know where conductivity is really important. That's that's less of a threat, but um, but I think uh, but but I think that's kind of you know one way to look at it for you know minerals in, in general. The one caveat I'll, I'll give there is that you have to kind of look at the the interplay and interconnectedness between uh, different uh, different minerals, and you don't want to necessarily kick the you know the 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 market balance problem from from one mineral um to, to something else um and then on the note of, of willingness to pay and I'll, I'll wrap this up to, in the interest of time you know uh one example i'll use is you know in on the fabricated side is electrical steel um has been used you know tr primarily in electrical machinery um for motors and, and generators but uh, but obviously we're seeing increased EV penetration um, that that's resulting in, in increased demand, uh, you know, both for electric motors and then also charging, and you know because they you know the automotive sector has a higher wi willingness to pay, uh, you know, for e steel that is is crowding out um, um, you know the the allocation of of supply to um, other sources. Of, of electrical machinery. Thanks, Frank. Nadal? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll jump in on the substitution front as well. Um, I think it's important to realize that substitution can occur at many different levels, whether it's element for element, alloy for alloy, material, technology, or even the system level, right? So we can think about, do we need, does everybody need to have an EV or can we have mass transportation? Right. There, there are many levels of substitution that occur, um, but we're already seeing some of the substitution already happening in some of the ba battery chemistries. Right. So, um, you know, realizing the, 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 the conflict and the constraints regarding cobalt, a lot of a lot of manufacturers are, are thinking and switching to the lithium iron phosphate chemistry that doesn't require cobalt or nickel. Right. And we're already seeing that in China and now seeing it more and more in the U.S. vehicles. Um, and so I think some manufacturers are able to switch. And the question is how quickly will substitution happen? What's the price point? One of the mandates that we have um, from recent legislation is to try to come up with supply and demand scenarios. And one of the things that we're going to try to do is to try not to look at demand independent of supply or vice versa. And so taking into account price elasticity of demand, which if in effect is measuring all of those levels of substitutions for the medium or sh uh, short term, um, will, will tell us a little bit about how substitutable some materials are for, for another. And so not just to have projections of, of demand just going up you know, endlessly, but actually constrained by what's, what's available based on, as Frank showed, what's available in terms of mines coming online and capacities and, and recycling rates. Um, quickly on the second point um, regarding uh, expertise, I think we are uh, significantly lacking in the United States and Abby pointed to this in terms of expertise at, at, at various stages of the supply chain. I think especially on the front end, the lack of extractive metallurgy in this country is becoming a, a significant concern. There are very few universities out there that, that still have courses on and, and degrees in extractive metallurgy. I think we need more of that. Um, I think research institutions like what uh, was not the Bureau of Mines could, could help along in, uh, in that way. Thank you. Jennifer? Okay, uh, so I will take, I think what was the, the final question around, um, around social effects impacts and kind of like standards. Um, I've spent a lot of time working in the, in the biofuel space where uh, there are sort of thresholds that the government has set in terms of life cycle greenhouse gas emissions for a biofuel to be eligible for renewable identification numbers that you know, it's entryway into the market. Um, and so it would indeed be interesting to explore something similar for batteries. I mean, the, right now the IRA, the standard is based than a percent of market value. And we're talking about how much market values fluctuate, which I'm wondering how that's gonna work, but different topic. Um, uh, so, but I do think that it would be interesting to explore potentially uh, a federal standard around environmental effects uh, per kilowatt hour, um, some 
get, we, this will be hard to get to, but some quantification of social effects per kilowatt hour um, and enabling the data collection that would be required to figure that out would indeed be really fascinating. There are, of course, some, some standards uh, like the, that pertain to metals, as, as uh, um, Amy mentioned, but, uh, you know, they don't necessarily stick. Um, and so it, it's been interesting also in the biofuel space, there are, for example, certification of sustainable biomass people can go and get, um, and but that's not required. So I think that there's some lessons to learn from other like analogous transitions that we've tried to undertake, uh, what went well, what didn't go well. And I think that's something worth exploring and, and applying in this space. And uh, for me, I guess that I will address, you know, consumer acceptance for higher cost, but I'll just say that, that yes, uh, what we're trying to do is to reduce that premium on the higher standard mined material by making sure that the way that others are able to produce these things more cheaply, uh, they are not able to exploit their workers or degrade the environment. And we think that when that true level playing field is created, that the price will maybe temporarily be higher, but then eventually come down because it will also enable more areas of supply to come online, which will increase the competition um, for those goods. Um, I also see a question in the chat about, you know, reducing consumption. And I feel like that is occasionally a bit difficult in a free market economy. To, um, but also, you know, some things that we think about, we have a coalition for reimagined mobility within my organization that is trying to think through big, bold transformational changes and how we get around. And one conversation, and it sort of depends on you know, what your emphasis is, but, you know, prioritizing where you put the minerals that you mine. Do you put it into things that can move more people at once, but that might, you know, slow down your decarbonization efforts if you do that. It's because more people drive individual cars in the U.S. So it's it's a bit of a trade-off. Okay, thank you. We have a couple of questions. Oh, we, we can't hear you well, Jim. I'm sorry. Um, so we have a couple questions and and we're getting close on our time we 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 need to wrap up in about five minutes so uh let me just uh, uh pose these abby mentioned the one on on reducing consumption of critical minerals in those which were um um uh which we can address the the other one that was out there is that there's a uh there's not a, a good understanding of the uh, in the general public about uh, the need for critical minerals that, and I think that uh, maybe maybe it's across the whole liter uh, literacy across the entire energy system. Um, you know what was pointed out in the question is you can just plug in your hybrid, you don't or your your electric vehicle, you don't think about where the electricity or the mining or minerals comes from. I, I think that applies probably generally to, you don't realize what is used to generate that electricity as long as it, it is on. So, so how do, uh, so maybe some final comments as we, as we close out on, on uh, that's one of our functions in this, uh, in this board meeting and the committees and the national academies, but what are other things that, that our panelists might do and I'll, I'll give you the option, we'll, we'll, we'll address that, but, but let's run through any final 30-second uh, comments that you wish to make on this panel. Let's do that at the same time. And uh, let's do, an, I'm gonna do it in reverse order, just Abby, everybody else had more time last time, so we'll go with you first. Thank you so much. Um, I think that, you know, as, as final wrap-up thoughts that just, uh, the importance of making sure that we can remine waste, that we know what is in those waste piles, that we're effectively mapping it, that we're using NCGMP, but also the National Geological and Geophysical Data Preservation Program uh, that exists to sort of go back and look at those rock cores and see what we might be missing um, will be incredibly important to making sure that we can diversify resources. Um, I, I didn't get to really talk about the, the more that we also 
excel in reprocessing of this mine waste, it will help us with recycling further down the line. Right now, we do not have enough spent material to subsist off of recycling alone. But after you get past black mass, the refining that it takes to get to that nickel sulfate, cobalt sulfate that goes into those cathodes, those processes are incredibly similar. So um, any advances that we can make in remining waste will also help us with recycling in the long run. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, so I think that two things, one, just uh, the need for, for data. So anything that we can do in the pre-competitive space around air quality, water quality, uh, and technology development to share data that enables things like life cycle assessment, but also early stage research to move ahead more quickly. I think that's really important. And my second plug is that as an educator, you know, it definitely is on my mind that uh, it's important for us to be bringing students up to speed in this. So to like at Northwestern, this is actually one of the things that I'm really passionate about. And um, I just uh, finished yesterday making a flyer for, for our first sort of study. It's a mini study, broad one week trip to Santiago, Chile to learn about lithium and copper mining because I want students who graduate from Northwestern to understand the supply chain implications of the minerals that they go and engineer into energy storage. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nadal? I'll carry on the education theme here. I, th I think it's it's vital that the, the public is made more and more aware and engaged in these issues at, at all levels. And I think I think academy uh, presentations like this help a lot. I think more and more can be done at both the university level and, and the K through 12. I think the, the younger uh, the audience is, the more we can get them engaged. I think there's a lot that can be done. I know the Smithsonian, for example, is doing an, a really great exhibit that's coming up, looking at the, the materials in your cell phone, for example. I think more and more things can be done to engage uh, younger audiences on these topics. Thank you. Thank you. Frank? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll echo uh, education as well and really building awareness. Uh, one, on, on just really the sense of urgency uh, in, you know, or across different minerals. Um, and then also about the, 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 the kind of um, the, the interconnectedness between, between different minerals um, and, and other, you know, kind of, you know, not just overall refined production, but really the entire, the entire value chain. Uh, I think as we've, you know, learned really from, from, from the automotive industry um, and, and the chip shortage, um, it isn't a summation of, of, um, of, of uh, supply chain issues. It's really a product. And if one thing goes, you know, goes wrong, that can really impact, uh, that, that can really impact uh, an entire industry. And so I think, you know, as we build, you know, more awareness about um, really the situation, the, the um, interconnectedness, um, then, then hopefully we can, you know, get, get, get going on a, uh, the number of solutions I think are going to be needed to, to, to fill the supply and demand gap. Well, thank you very much. I've just been advised we do have a couple extra minutes because we're waiting to transition. So I know one of our board members wanted to pose a question. So Harvey, can I, I, I know you put it in the chat, but I, I think since you're here, if you could just verbally uh, articulate, it'd be great. I, I can. Thank you, Jim. Um, yes, I, I want to address the elephant. A lot of this gap, this, this crisis we're facing is driven by the growth in electric vehicles. And I would like to know, like, I, I would say that we need to talk about a mobility transition in, the, in addition to an, an energy transition. And I'm, I'm not so sure we can just assume that the growth in EVs are going, just going to continue. A lot of it is not just demand driven, it's policy driven, just like the growth of automobiles originally in the early part of the 20th century was actually a uh, Top down and, and policy driven. So, uh, and we can see examples of cities in Europe which are making mobility transitions, and also young people in the United States who are less interested in car ownership. So, I guess I would like to ask the speakers, or anyone would like to address this have you done any policy simulations surrounding um, actions to move us towards a post automobile future? I, I think that's great. Let me just, if, I, if you don't mind, Harvey, I'm going to add to that. And doesn't this complicate? This whole issue is a huge complication for mining companies that are trying to make investment decisions on mines that at best will start in 15 years and more likely to be 20 or 25 years before they start production and profitability some years after that. So, 
we'll, we'll, we'll take a chance for uh, any of our speakers want uh, address that broader societal issues and investment issues. I, mean, I think that this is a parallel discussion I'm, I'm hearing in so many sectors, right? So just on Monday, we had a sustainability symposium here and we had a speaker from the Global Organization to Decarbonize Maritime Technologies and she was discussing all the different technology options and someone from the audience asked, but can't we just ship fewer things? Same thing around plastics, you know, can't we just use fewer plastics? So I think that uh, to me, this is a societal societal issue and it's, uh, yes, I agree, Europe, I, like, I like going to the walkable cities there. Um, so I like, Again, I'm just an engineer. I'm not quite sure how to achieve uh, that level of societal transition. So I have five minutes on that would be great. And, and I would defer to my Coalition for Reimagined Mobility colleagues, Harvey, but I will certainly be willing to connect you with them offline. They are examining exactly this problem. And of course, there's the, the rural urban divide um, that we need to think about and make sure that everybody has access to these things too. Not everybody lives in a city where you could easily walk around the corner. They're concerned with right-sizing mobility so that, you know, if you do live in a city, you don't take your 2000 pound Hummer, you can take a scooter instead. <laughs> so um, I, I think there are certainly many options that can be examined there, but there's not going to be a one size fits all, especially when you think about different countries and their level of development too. Nadal or Frank, anything to add on that? I'll just add really quickly on that last point that Abby was making. I think it's really important to look at the developing countries or maybe, maybe even the underdeveloped countries and think about their transitions, right? So are they going to be following a trajectory that's similar to the developed countries or are they going to be following something that's quite different? And how do we design and build those cities that are going to be emerging, uh, whether it's in sub-Saharan Africa or elsewhere, that are going to be growing and that's where the population is going to be coming from? That's where a lot of the demand is going to be coming, and the question is which trajectory and which uh, which commodities are going to be needed to make that transition for them, or or that really can they leapfrog some of these technologies depending on how, for example, we we design our cities. Right. Yeah, that, that's that's a great point, and I think it reminds me a lot of of you know cell phone infrastructure in uh, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, and I think. I think you're absolutely right that there's, you know, an opportunity uh, here for, for kind of a similar um, leapfrogging as well. Okay. Well, I want to, uh, I think we've had some great input in this opening panel. I think it started our day well and, and has created a lot of, of thought as we move into some of the uh, uh, discussions this afternoon. So, um, so first, please join me in thanking our, uh, our, our great panelists that kicked us off today. Thank you very much. For the board, we'll now, we're just going to take uh, a lunch break for those in, well, for everybody, I guess those not in person, but we will start back up at 1 p.m. Eastern time uh, promptly. And so we ask you if you're online to rejoin us at 1 p.m.
Welcome back everyone from lunch and welcome to those who might be joining us for the, for the afternoon uh, sessions. We are going to start with our second panel, Remining and Associated Impacts. And I'd like to pass the mic uh, to our moderator, Deborah Peacock, who is the president and CEO of Peacock uh, Law. Deborah. Um, Isabel, thank you. Um, I'm also a, I'm sorry, you can hear me now? Okay. Um, I'm a uh, metallurgical engineer with mineral processing and also a registered patent attorney. So I have the honor of working with um, many companies who are involved in remining and remediation technologies for critical minerals. And today, these panelists, um, they're going to talk about mapping of these mining resources. And then there's three case studies um, about different technologies for critical minerals. So our first um, panelist is Warren Day. Um, Warren is a research geologist with, and the uh, science coordinator for the USGS. He's with the Earth Mapping Resources Initiative, known as Earth MRI. And Earth MRI is mapping the nation's critical mineral resources. Um, Warren received his undergraduate degree in earth and planetary science from Washington University and his doctorate in geology and geophysics from the University of Minnesota. So Warren, please welcome. <coughs> Uh, thank you so much for inviting the USGS to participate in this panel discussion. Can you hear me all right? Uh, thank you. Um, so the USGS has a, 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 uh, a, is mapping the, the nation's critical mineral resources. We've been doing this for decades. Uh, and today I'd like to talk about an activity we have going on within our Earth Mapping Resources Initiative. Um, this figure uh, is uh, common to, uh, you know, well known amongst this crowd. On the left is our cascading uh, dependence on uh, import reliance on, on critical minerals that has been developed uh, annually by the uh, uh, center. And Nadal uh, presented earlier in panel one. Uh, these data really do fo uh, form the foundation of defining what a critical mineral is. And um, this audience is very well aware of the issues related to our, our continuing and growing uh, net import reliance. So what is the USGS doing in this arena? Um, okay, here we go. So uh, today we're talking about remining. Um, and you know, our, our, our overarching challenge is how do we enhance our uh, supply chain for sources of critical minerals, as well as other strategic metals in the economy to really uh, help uh, address the global low carbon economy that's uh, coming, we, we are in, we're in the beginning of. So as you all know, uh, the, the sources of uh, metals in our uh, economy are really start with a hole in the ground uh, figuratively speaking, mining, uh, and then there can be remining from a metal recovery and mineral uh, and mine waste and mineral processing uh, materials. Recycling is also a growing component of the metal life cycle, and as was uh, talked about in the earlier panel, a uh, metal substitution is gaining uh, uh, ground. So Earth MRI really addresses uh, two parts of the life cycle of the metals in our economy. We, we are generating uh, data for trying to understand where the critical mon uh, 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 minerals can occur, both above the ground in mine waste materials, as well as uh, below the ground in undiscovered deposits. So our, our sphere of, of uh, work is really in that providing the uh, information critical for understanding the upstream supply of commodities, as well as trying to get a handle on what is available in mine waste materials so they can be remined. So this uh, activity primarily falls within the USGS under the Mineral Resources Program. 
And our program is really uh, has three components, the minerals information, which uh, uh, the National Minerals Information Center uh, leads that effort, uh, looking at uh, future supply uh, and risk uh, analysis. Our uh, bedrock research and assessment activities, as well as the new, relatively new activity called the Earth Mapping Resources Initiative. So within MRP, um, our research has many uh, facets, uh, looking at the methods uh, to characterize the legacy mine uh, sites. It's not easy. Uh, they're very complex uh, beasts. Uh, the technologies uh, available for remediation, and we're working uh, with DOE and uh, building that, uh, that relationship. Um, our swim lane is primarily understanding the mineralogy and the resources themselves. Uh, DOE's uh, very strong in the, in the mineral processing component. Uh, we also look at uh, how the uh, metals uh, associated with ore deposits uh, impact the environment uh, and try and classify the different kinds of uh, mine waste materials. Uh, we're also starting a new activity uh, trying to develop a database for abandoned or legacy mine lands in partnership with the Department of of interior. So Earth MRI, in uh, 2019, uh, we uh, had an, and we were started with a, a tranche of 9.6 million. Now we're at 10.6 million for our annual appropriations. But the bipartisan infrastructure law really has been transformational. And we are now able to uh, accelerate the program with a, a tranche of $64 million per year over a five-year period. And what we're doing with that is we're, we're supporting the state geological surveys to do detailed geologic mapping and reconnaissance studies across the nation for uh, areas that are have potential for both critical and strategic metals. Uh, we, we are uh, doing an airborne, national airborne magnetic and radiometric campaign, as well as localized uh, areas for uh, airborne uh, EM. Uh, we're supporting the three depth program for uh, collecting the, and filling in the holes of our, in our nation's LIDAR coverage. And then we're starting a new effort in mine waste inventory and characterization. That's led by the National uh, the Minerals Resources Program. And then we support our uh, national, uh, the uh, uh, data preservation program. Um, and in the partnership with them, we, we are reanalyzing drill core materials for critical minerals that, and you know, there's a wealth of information at the state's geological surveys uh, we're trying to make uh, publicly available and we're making this all available online uh, as we go forward. We just like two days ago released uh, a national map, a summary map for all of the critical minerals uh, uh, across the US. And we do this by using a mineral systems approach and looking at different kinds of mineral systems uh, that could host critical minerals. But those mineral systems also uh, are, um, host uh, metals like copper, uh, you know, the ones that don't fall on the critical minerals list, we, we are mapping those as well. Um, now, looking right now is uh, Earth MRI, what, what, what are the issues we're trying to uh, address? Well, where are the uh, critical minerals and how much mine waste is there? Uh, there's really no national inventory of the mine waste material out there and what the, the, their critical mineral contents are. And there really is no systematic assessment of these things. So that's really where we're trying to start our efforts in, in the arena of uh, addressing the data needs for remining. So to accomplish this, we're, we're working with the state geological surveys to develop a mine waste inventory, a geospatial database uh, of historical mine waste uh, materials uh, that we're using our uh, pre our uh, US Min database as a starting point. And now we're starting an effort to characterize those waste materials and map them as best we can over the next uh, several years. We, we're not going to get every dog hole and every small uh, prospect out there, but we're hopefully we're, we we will get the majority of the major mineral uh, waste materials out there. So that's where we're starting. We're trying to focus on the big uh, deposits out there that will move the needle 
uh, on supplying or at least understanding where the critical minerals are. So in the arena of, uh, of remining, there are some successes out there, right? So uh, uh, in the, the historic uh, Mississippi Valley uh, type deposit district in, uh, in Southern Missouri, uh, a company called Missouri Cobalt is actually recovering cobalt from the mine waste materials that were left behind when uh, lead zinc was being recovered. The other one re referred to earlier uh, was is Rio Tinto's effort for recovering lithium out of their boron plants in, in the, uh, out in California. So there are successes out there, but I just want to close with some thoughts on this whole uh, topic of remining is very complex. It's not si simple. It would be wonderful to, to be able to go out and, and re reclaim uh, and, uh, and process metals for the uh, mine waste that are out there. But the economics have to be there uh, for a company to make that investment. And there are uh, technological issues. The, the geology has to be right. There has to be sufficient uh, quantities of metals. Uh, the uh, mineral species have to be uh, present that will uh, allow for uh, reprocessing and recovery. There's all kinds of engineering issues related to the metallurgy. Uh, there's access, power, uh, infrastructure issues, workforce issues that must be addressed. Um, and of course, the water quality issues related to uh, uh, remining are very uh, prevalent and so they need to be addressed during the uh, or, uh, remining efforts. And then there's the whole uh, existential uh, challenges we face on the non-technical issues, that, that being uh, land access, ownership, uh, legal, uh, legal issues related to recovery of uh, and reclamation. The liability uh, concerns uh, due to past mining uh, issues. And, and, you know, there's been a lot of talk over the years about the Good, Good Samaritan legislation. Well, okay, but I've been hearing about that since the 1990s. And so are, are we going to move the needle here on this? And, and of course, that's not the USGS's uh, uh, swim lane, but it really does need to be addressed. And of course, the whole issue uh, related to social licensing to re remine, uh, and because of the heavy industry that's uh, involved in, in reprocessing materials. So that's really, I wanted to keep my uh, comments short so I could hear the rest of the uh, panelists. So thank you so much for the time. So thank you, Warren. Um, I'm going to ask uh, just one question and then other questions we can save for the entire panel discussion. Um, I'm, I'm glad you received more money under the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, what are the, the resource and funding and staffing constraints at the state geological surveys and at the USGS? Well, um, let's pretend one has all the money that one needs. It's the people, um, right? And so, uh, over the years, uh, the field of economic geology and metallurgy, uh, the, the workforce has really decreased. And so we're, because of the new funding, we can start bringing in new, new people to help us. Uh, the states are hiring uh, new folks. We are as well. And then we're partnering with universities as well as we move forward, uh, primarily through funding streams that go to the states and then out to their, uh, their state universities. So... I would say that the choke point right now is expertise. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And we're gonna move on to our next panelist. I'd like to introduce Ed Aslin. He's the um, professor and tier two Canada research chair in aqueous processing of metals at the University of British Columbia. And he's in the Department of Materials Engineering. Um, Ed is a co-inventor of the jetty copper leasing process. And he's going to talk about um, hydrometallurgy in general and also this um, jetty process. Welcome, Ed. Thank you. Thanks, Deborah, for the introduction. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. I can. Okay, Thank great. you. 
And hopefully you can see the slides. Slides are good. Okay, great. Um, so thanks for inviting me to speak today. I'll, I'll try and, and be uh, succinct here. So I'm gonna talk about remining of calcopyrite ores and we'll talk about jetty technology. Um, first, I have a few introductory slides. Um, this is uh, a quote from a really great um, uh, paper from the International Energy Agency, which is, uh, was updated fairly recently, which says that the transition to clean energy means a shift from a fuel intensive to a material intensive energy system. And uh, these are my words. I think the materials demands are going to be massive, and I, I'm not sure how prepared we are for that uh, globally. Uh, so I hope some of the things we'll talk about today will, will help address this uh, massive uh, requirement for materials. Uh, I'm going to talk about copper. So I thought I'd speak briefly to some examples of why we need copper. Uh, we want to build wind turbines. Uh, a three megawatt wind turbine is about uh, 500 feet tall. It has three to four tons of copper in the generator alone and one to two tons of copper in the transformer. And then of course you've got tens of kilometers of uh, copper cabling. Uh, and you can see a picture of that on the right. Uh, so the, the amount of copper required is just really uh, staggering when you start to add up all these technologies. If we look at copper production over the last uh, 150 or so years, uh, it's been increasing at a compound rate of about 2.8 5%. Um, and this is data from the French Geological Survey. I've added today's or this year's production, or sorry, I should say 2021 production, which was about 21 million tons. So we're pretty much bang on that curve. Um, on the current trajectory, if we keep consuming copper and producing it at the same rate, the market's very tight. Uh, we're going to make more copper in the next 25 years. Uh, than has ever been made in the last 5,000 years. Uh, and as I said, right now, the, the market is very tight. So production uh, and consumption are very close, about 400 kilotons. Uh, and so the stocks are either stable or, or are depleting. And there's lots of data on that on the International Copper uh, Study Group website. So as I said, um, the, the, uh, the um, market is tight. And we know that copper is essential. You can see here on the left, a graph from the IEA that shows uh, anticipated copper needs in red and yellow lines. And that's depending on how aggressive we are with respect to implementing uh, these uh, renewable energy technologies. And then the uh, light blue and darker blue colors are the committed mine production uh, over the next uh, 15 or so years. Uh, so just to, Color that a little bit, BHP estimates that production will have to double over the next 30 years. Um, S&P is forecasting 9.9 uh, .9 million ton supply cap in 2035. CRU is forecasting $100 billion expenditure needed on mines to close this deficit, which is going to be about 4.7 million tons by 2030, which is consistent roughly with what the IEA is predicting. And the U.S. could have to import 67% of its refined copper by 2035. Uh, so copper is going to be a challenge, I think. Uh, so why is production decreasing? There's a number of factors, but these are the three that I believe are the most important. So the grade currently, uh, ore grade is about 0.6%, so six kilograms of copper uh, and 994 kilograms of surrounding rock. That is a technological challenge to separate. Waste rocks, of course, have a lower copper grade because the, uh, they're cut off uh, for production. So typically waste rocks are 0.3% or lower. And so remining that becomes a technological issue just because of the low copper content. The type, uh, most of the copper on the planet is, uh, is in the form of calcopyrite, copper iron sulfide. And that's currently processed through smelting. And a lot of the rem remining technologies involve hydrometallurgical approaches. So putting the copper into a solution and then recovering it using electro winning. Uh, and that's hard to do with calcopyrite for reasons I'll get to in a couple of minutes. And then we have a shortage of investment in the area. So uh, exploration budgets have been low. Um, only three significant deposits have been discovered since 2017. And we all know that there's a lot of regulatory risk with building mines uh, all over the world, uh, including in Canada. And also the cost of building a mine has gone up substantially 
over the last uh, few decades. Okay, so uh, uh, the previous speaker had a slide similar to this. Uh, so the potential solutions to the shortfall for copper, so there are four that are commonly cited. So substitution is one, uh, but there are four metals that are widely used and that are very hard to substitute in their primary uses. So copper, lead, manganese, and chromium are those four. And there's a nice study on that uh, in PNAS, um, which is uh, from 2015. There are limits on recycling, which I'll talk about in a couple of minutes. Uh, remining is an option. And the other one potentially is decreasing consumption, but I, I'm not sure how we're gonna get there. And that's beyond uh, my pay grade in terms of policy. So this is a sort of well-known limit of recycling, but I, I think it bears repeating uh, because I often hear people saying that uh, we should just recycle more. Um, the, op the average copper unit is placed in service for about 35 years. Um, so the copper that was produced 35 years ago is never going to be sufficient to account for the demand today because of the 2.85% uh, or roughly 3% growth rate in consumption. So the theoretical recycling potential today uh, is about 38% uh, of what our demand is, uh, just because of the fact that the copper is in, in use for 35 years. So mining or remining or other solutions are going to be necessary to produce uh, the copper needed. Certainly recycling is part of the solution, but definitely not a panacea. In terms of remining some of the options, and this is specifically set up for copper. Um, so generally what we do with uh, chalcopyrite, which is again, is the main mineralization, is we uh, reduce the size, we float the chalcopyrite to separate it from the gang minerals. Uh, so that's the concentration step that goes to a smelter and from the smelter, we get copper. Of course, there are wastes that come out of the smelter as well. I, I was running out of room on the slide, so I don't have that. Uh, but the concentration step also makes tailings, and those are a potential option for remining, although that's quite tricky and technologically difficult. Uh, we can also take the run of mine ore and reduce the size and stack it in heaps. Typically, that's done for oxide ores of copper. Uh, and from there, you leach the copper out and recover it. Uh, and of course, you might have some residues depending on how aggressively you leached that particular heap leach. Uh, there may be some copper left in there that you could go after later. Uh, and then we have uh, dumps where we, we don't do any size reduction and we have some more that may have some copper in it, but we, we put it in some kind of a, a dump to leach slowly over time. We may stop leaching if it becomes economic. We have stockpiles, uh, which are used for, for blending purposes or for storing copper units for whatever reason, which may have been left uh, because they were below grade at some point and could be remined. And then there's a whole host of other types of waste that uh, could potentially be mined. So the majority of the copper in these remining targets is the low-grade chalcopyrite, this copper iron sulfide. So currently about 80% of the world's copper is made uh, through smelters and through the concentration process. But as the ore grade declines, it becomes harder and harder to concentrate, or more expensive, I should say, to concentrate the copper and then send it to smelters. Uh, the other 20% of the copper worldwide is uh, coming from oxide heat leaches and to a, a smaller degree, secondary sulfide, chalcocyte, covalite heat leaches. Um, and so that's the green thing that you see on the slide here. So generally though, uh, the green part is the leaching of oxides and the yellow is the, the smelters. So what we're trying to do in, in a lot of these cases of remining is to take these low grade chalcopyrite ores and put them into some sort of a heap leach where we can leach the copper out using the technology that's been established for leaching uh, copper oxides. I should mention that the reason this comes about in, in the early 1960s is that General Mills developed uh, liquid ion exchanger 62 in 1962, which was an enabling technology for us to separate copper from iron in acid solutions. And so that's why we have this, uh, this green area now. So the reason why we don't leach chalcopyrite in these heaps and why it's a bit tricky to remine or it has historically been tricky is that chalcopyrite passivates. So when we put it in an acid solution, it reacts with the acid and it forms a layer on its surface, which is very, very hard to, um, to get past. And so the, the remaining mineral just doesn't leach. Typical recoveries for copper from a calcopyrite heap 
are on the order of 10 or 20 percent, which makes it totally uneconomic. Um, UBC has been working on this problem since the early 80s. Uh, I've been working on it since 2008 and uh, with Jetty's help since 2014. And we were able to develop a technology which specifically targets that passive film and allows us now to leach the copper from chalcopyrite uh, in heaps, uh, which is a big advantage for remining. So the next few slides are specific to the, this case study of uh, the application of Jetty technology at the Pinto Valley mine in Arizona. The predominant uh, mineralogy again is the chalcopyrite. Uh, they were leaching this in, uh, in a dump um, and it started to become uneconomic in the early 2010s and they stopped adding material in 2015. Uh, Jetty was contacted in 2017 and proved out with test work that it was feasible to start extracting copper economically uh, at near the end of 2018. And by May 2019, they had built a small plant on the site and started leaching the copper again. So how does this work? Uh, sometimes the technology for remining is very, very complex, and sometimes it's, it can be very simple. This is a case where everything lines up for the solution to be quite simple. So you have an existing brownfield site with an existing uh, dump heap, uh, existing facilities for electrowinning and solvent extraction, uh, an existing uh, raffinate pond, everything had already been on site. And then the only thing that we did, or the jetty did, I should say, was to add a catalyst plant to uh, add catalyst to the leach to enable the leaching of the calcopyrite, which had not been leached, and get those extra copper units. So here's a picture of the existing site, the dump leach area up here, the mine located down here, the existing solvent extraction facilities, the electro-winning cell house, the cathode yard where the copper is stored for sale, and this is the jetty catalyst addition facility. So this is the only thing that was added, and then the catalyst runs up to the dump and then back through the solvent extraction, extraction with no major infrastructure changes. And the result here was um, a nearly doubling of copper production per uh, irrigated area. So this is a nice example of a, of a successful remining approach um, with minimal disturbance to uh, what was already there. So I think I've shown that we need, we're gonna need more copper um, and, and specifically with our goals of decarbonization or electrification of the economy, it's gonna it's going to become a, a huge issue, I think, getting this copper. Much of the copper will come from mining and remining. Uh, the technologies that enable re remining uh, significantly reduce capital and regulatory risk as they're typically deployed on brownfield sites. Um, Jetty is an example of that, um, which targets specifically waste materials, so low grade ores. And remining brings more units of metal to market with hopefully a lower environmental footprint. So I think that there's a lot of potential in this area. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you so much for, for this explanation of what you're doing. Um, since you're at UBC, which still has a strong metallurgy program and hydrometallurgy program, uh, what's going on in higher education? We're going to need um, processors for all of this technology for remining. Yeah, thanks, Deborah. That's a that's a big problem for us. We have a lot of trouble attracting um, young people into the area of metallurgy uh, and uh, and mineral extraction in general, um, and, and that's across the country. Most of the materials engineering departments in Canada have have started focusing on material science because the government has put a lot of money into uh, that area rather than in the more traditional. Uh, metallurgical fields. And now that there's a, an increasing demand for people in this area and an increasing demand for metals, uh, it's gonna be a bit of a challenge to, to make that swap. So yeah, I think this is a, a, a major challenge for us in the next uh, probably 10, 10 to 15 years or so. Okay, thank you. And I'm gonna do one more comment um, that you told me in that in Canada, copper is on the list of critical minerals unlike in the US and Europe. And I found that really interesting. Yeah, I think that is interesting. I'm not, <laughs> not sure uh, why those differences exist, but certainly I think it should be looked at as a potential strategic uh, metal. Okay. Thank you, Ed. So our next speaker um, panelist is Mackenzie Lyon.
Hi there. How are you all? Hi. Can you um, hear me and see my screen? Yes. All right. Oh. Excellent. Well, they're good. So, so Mackenzie Lyon is the Vice President of External Affairs at Perpetual Resources in Idaho. And McKinsey works on the Stibnut Gold Project. Um, Stibnut's important because it has antimony. It's a critical mineral used for energy, defense, and technology. And McKinsey's going to talk about um, as a case study on this Stibnut Gold Project. Well, thank you all for the invitation to be here today. As mentioned, I'm McKinsey Lyon, and I work for Perpetua Resources. And I'm really excited to participate in this conversation today, in part because I truly believe that remining abandoned sites and brownfield sites not only offer a path to begin solving some of the most critical and challenging issues for our economy, national security, and energy future, but I also believe that it provides an opportunity to help us as an industry rebuild trust in domestic mining. So I'm really excited to share a little bit more with you about our story as a case study. So as mentioned, the Stibnite Gold Project is located in central Idaho, about four hours from Boise in the Payette National Forest. And if I were to summarize the uniqueness of the project, I would say it is unique for three reasons. The first, is that it's located on an abandoned mine site that really does need help today from an environmental legacy standpoint. And our project is designed to address those legacies right in the very beginning. Secondly, the Stibnite Gold Project would be the only US mined source of the critical mineral antimony, which is critical to national defense and energy products, but today is controlled by China, Russia, and Tajikistan. And finally, I think we are unique because of the approach we have taken as a company to help define and show what responsible American mineral production can look like by prioritizing both community partnerships and environmental responsibility alongside the safe and economic production of the minerals that our country needs. And so to take a step back and describe the project a little bit, the Stibnite Mining District has been mined and has a long history of mining that really goes back until 1899 when started in the region for gold and silver. But the site didn't take significance until the eve of World War II, when the blockade in the Pacific meant that the United States no longer had a source of tungsten or antimony, both of which were critical if we were going to get into the war. And so the U.S. government set out and they found both tungsten and antimony at Stibnite, Idaho, and commissioned the Bradley Mining Company to produce both for the war effort. And in fact, Stibnite, Idaho produced the majority of antimony and tungsten used during World War II by the, by the United States and was credited with having shortened World War II by a year and saving a million American lives. And I think this is an incredibly important story when we can remember our past, that it is not new to have supply chain issues and just how significant it can be to our history um, and our future to produce these minerals here and have control over them. But on the other side of that coin, the mining, the majority of the mining that occurred at Stibnite occurred long before environmental regulations were put in place or even on ethos on how to mine and how to leave it when you're done. And so as a result, there are some pretty massive environmental legacies that were left behind, including 10 and a half million tons of unlined legacy tailings and waste that are interacting with water quality and, and leaching arsenic and, and antimony into the water. The East Fork, South Fork of the Salmon River now flows into an abandoned mining pit. And this has stopped salmon migration for up to 20 miles of additional habitat for the last 80 years. But between 2000 and 2012, there were three CERCLA decrees that allowed all former operators and US governmental entities to walk away from any future responsibility over the environmental conditions of site. So this means that without a large scale private industry solution, these environmental problems will most likely continue unabated. 
So while we know that it's a brownfield site and it's had all this mining, we also know that there is a really robust mineral reserve still available at Stipnite. So the project economics are built on 4.8 million ounces of gold, which allows for, pays for, and makes feasible the production of the 148 million pound antimony resource and the restoration of the legacy features. So without the gold, we wouldn't be able to access the antimony or provide the site restoration that we are able to. So from the very beginning as a company, we very much knew that if we were gonna go back to an abandoned mine site and redevelop it, we were gonna to have to come with solutions, not only for the environmental legacies that were left behind, but also to bring value to our communities and to build trust with our communities. And we very much have designed the project plan around this question of, well, how can we use mining to leave the area better than it is today? And so right from the first years of construction, we saw the largest source of sedimentation in the watershed. We will pick up and reprocess, honestly, the tailings that are left behind and then safely store them in a an aligned tailing storage facility to help improve water quality. And we'll also reconnect fish passage in the first year of mining, first through a fish passageway, and then over time, and we will backfill and uh, reconstruct the river, the allowing volitional passage for, uh, for fish to over 20 miles of additional habitat that has been blocked for over 80 years. And in, and in reconstructing this river, we really go beyond what we call like a reclamation standard and, and push towards a restoration standard where we can enhance fish habitat and stream conditions at the same time. Now, as a company, I will also say that there is no question that abandoned mine lands need help now and that mining and that they can be a source for critical minerals. But there are also questions of liability that can complicate that type of action. So as a company, when we start, first started investigating the site in 2009 in our water st study data, told us a pretty clear story that we knew that we needed to offer solutions to Stibnite. And those studies that we were looking at were showing us that in the high flow seasons, we were getting readings of arsenic in groundwater at 700 times the drinking water standard. And you can see on this map here where blue water, clean water is coming into site, going past um, legacy features and picking up arsenic as it moves through site. So we went to the EPA and the Forest Service looking for an opportunity, not only on how we could help now, but how could we look at long-term solutions as well, while also addressing the liability um, that remains at the site. And so after three years of discussion in 2021, we entered into an agreement the, an administrative order, we call it the ASAOC, that gave us permission to act now. So a four-year first phase of early action cleanup that allows us to keep clean water clean by rerouting streams and lining them, and then also removing 325,000 tons of legacy waste away from the river at our own cost, but under the direction of the EPA. And then should the project be permitted, the agreement also gives us permission to incorporate cleanup of anything that is off the project footprint site, but still in the legacy historical district that needs to be addressed. So really allowing for a comprehensive cleanup of the entire historical district. Now, a little bit on the critical mineral antimony, um, which is a very unique feature for our project. I like to say quite often that antimony is an unsung hero. We use it in our everyday lives, yet most of us have never heard of it. Um, so from defense products to semiconductors and the coatings and the wiring of your home, it is literally everywhere around us. Um, and it's designated as a critical mineral because it is so important to these things we need, but our supply is vulnerable. And our supply is vulnerable because over the last many decades, the Chinese um, have really taken control over the resource, not only from their own resource in country, but very systematically taking um, control by purchasing the mineral resources around the globe 
and the processing facilities. So that today, 90% of the global supply of antimony comes from China, Russia, and Tajikistan. However, the Stibnite Gold Project offers the, one of the largest economic reserves of antimony not controlled by the Chinese and their interests, and we could supply about 35% of U.S. commercial demand just in the first six years of the project, putting us back in control of our supply chain for clean energy technology and defense minerals. And for us as a company, um, part of that means we've entered into an agreement with an American company called Ambry, based in Massachusetts, and they are developing a very unique storage battery technology. It is based on two things, antimony and calcium. So this liquid metal battery offers a solution as a stationary grid level storage battery, battery for clean energy, which we all know are those missing pieces of getting green energy onto a grid in a reliable fashion. These batteries are a very interesting and compelling opportunity in comparison to some of the lithium ion ones that dominate the market today. They have a 20 year lifespan, they're fully recyclable and really um, are lower cost than many others in the market today. With our agreement, we can provide them enough antimony to store 13 gigawatt hours of solar on a daily cycle which means is essentially the equivalent of powering a million American homes with solar for every day for 20 years. So in addition to its future role on the energy transition, it also is a really important mineral for the Department of Defense in that, and just like it was back during World War II, because of the role it, antimony trisulfide plays in primers. And unfortunately, we're in a situation where most of the commercial producers um, in the United States rely on Chinese sources, and that supply is intermittent. And the Stibnite Gold Project, once again, has an opportunity to help reshore and secure that supply chain. Um, and again, we can see kind of a, a bigger picture here of you know, who exactly is in control today of antimony and where, it's, um, where we get it. Just really quickly, so you know, we're we're in the process of, of trying to move this project forward through the NEPA process. So just to give a quick snapshot into what that looks like, um, we are in our sixth year of trying to get through the joint review process under NEPA. And while I can honestly say that um, the NEPA process is probably longer and less efficient than we would like it to be it has helped improve both the environmental and the social aspects of our project. So we submitted our project in 2016 to the US Forest Service. Then in 2020, they issued a draft environmental impact statement. And now just as of last week, a supplemental draft environmental impact statement was published. And we hope for a record of decision next year. I will say though, that it is important to note that we started this venture in 2010 when we identified that we had the opportunity to produce gold and antimony. And right now we think that we will produce in 2027. That is a 17 year timeline from identifying the mineral resource to getting it into production. And that timeline is just too long if we were gonna solve the problems that we're facing today. But again, you know, just quickly, the, the process has made our project better. In 2020 on the comment period we heard, reduce the water temperature, improve water quality, reduce the size of your project footprint. And we were able to do that and provide some changes back to the Forest Service to do just those things. And those are being reviewed currently in the supplemental draft EIS just published by the Forest Service. And lastly, this, I would just say that American mining is in a position today to rebuild trust because both our policymakers and the public, it's like the door has opened to recognition that we do need to produce here. And so we have worked very diligently over the last 12 years to ensure that we can be a responsible, safe and beneficial partner to our communities um, from a profit sharing foundation to our commitment to dark skies and ESG reporting. I do believe that the path that we have charted as a company is helping to create an American mining industry that the public is proud of. And when we mine it in America, we take back control over the environmental, the social, 
the labor and the economic conditions of production. And starting with brownfields offer an opportunity for us to prove that American mining is the right choice. It offers us an opportunity to, with a lower risk to show the public what we can do today. And with that, I am happy to answer any questions you might have. Mackenzie, thank you. Um, I'll just ask one question. Um, thanks for showing us the permitting timeline. Has the permitting gotten any faster because you're doing all this cleanup work? Um, that's a really interesting question. You know, I will honestly say we thought it would. When we started out, we really saw this project as an opportunity where the agencies, both state and federal and stakeholders, we can all recognize that the site needs help and it it needs a massive investment and industrial scale work to solve the problems that are there today. But unfortunately, the policy and kind of legal framework of abandoned mine sites of CERCLA doesn't provide a very clean picture or clean path on how redevelopment can happen without as a company ab absorbing the potential risk past actions. And that's why the agreement we signed was so important to us. Not only did it give us the opportunity to show, hey, we mean what we say. When we say we want to do the right thing by the environment, we want to address these legacies, and we believe we are part of that solution. But it also helped just clarify for us where kind of the legal liabilities were and, and, and were not. Um, but the, you know, the NEPA process is it's robust and um, not always efficient as, as we thought it would be with such a clear and apparent need for a site that has already um, been mined and does need help today. Thank you. And for those of you who are participating, I hope you'll continue on to panel three where some of these issues will also be discussed um, during that presentation. All right, our, our next speaker is Grayson Buckingham from DISA. Hi, Deborah, how are you? Good. Okay, I've got your slides, I can hear you, so this is good. Excellent. <laughs> All right, um, Grayson Buckingham is the CEO and president of DISA Technologies. Um, he has a JD and MBA in energy management from the University of Wyoming. And he's going to talk about a case study um, where DISA is working with the U.S. EPA and the Navajo Nation EPA regarding abandoned uranium mines, and then also some other mines for uh, reclamation and remining. So thank you. No, thank you so much for having me. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be on this panel to discuss these important topics. So um, as Deborah um, mentioned, uh, I'm president and CEO of DISA Technologies, and so we'll be talking about a patented process we have um, that we've used on a, a variety of different applications where um, our main goal is to, uh, the, the technical mining term is liberate um, certain target minerals to make it easier to separate. And um, we do that through our process called high pressure soil ablation that I'll get into in um, greater detail. But, you know, as um, you know, other um, panelists had brought up today, uh, you know, there, there's an issue with, uh, you know, how expensive it is to extract these uh, target minerals that have been left in, in waste rock piles or tailings um, piles. And in, in the mining industry, 50% um, uh, of the total energy uh, is used just to make rock smaller. Um, and, and that translates to um, up to 4% of global electricity is what's called the technical term is comminution, but making rock smaller so that the idea of the smaller the rock is, the easier it is to separate that target mineral um, that, that, um, that we're going after. So the way that HIPSA technology works, uh, it's a mechanical process. We don't use any chemicals and we take a slurry. Um, so we take that waste rock or tailings or, or whatever that material is that we're looking to treat. Um, and we put, introduce it in a slurry form and create these particle to particle collisions as you can see in this um, computational fluid um, dynamic uh, and numerical modeling um, animation where we're, we're having those slurries uh, collide against each other. And these particle to particle collisions 
uh, create a unique application of energy um, that breaks apart um, those inner that has those intergranular fractures. So you know, whereas a lot of uh, conventional grinding and crushing technologies just indiscriminately break uh, that ore to smaller pieces, uh, our technology can, um, in in a sense, selectively liberate um, those different target minerals um, along those uh, with those phase um, boundary fractures. So this kind of in a practical sense, what this looks like. Um, here, this is a, um, a uranium vanadium bearing material that we would find in the Western United States. Uh, that sand grain in that image on the left is uh, covered, has that mineral patina coating uh, where those heavy metals are and where that uranium vanadium uh, resides in. Um, and so running it through our system, this is uh, an example of one of our uh, pieces of equipment where you can see the two different pumps in the collision chamber here. Uh, we're able to break off that mineral patina coating or liberate that uranium vanadium. So we have that clean intact sand grain uh, while removing those, those heavy metals um, from that coating. So what that looks like here, um, the, the X axis is the different sizes in mesh. Uh, so the higher the number, the smaller it gets. Uh, and then this is the percentage of that mineral. So the, the gray bar shows the overall mass. Uh, and the yellow here shows the uranium and the uranium and vanadium uh, almost track identically. Um, so if you were just to take the material without putting it through our system from like a waste rock pile that has uranium vanadium um, in it, uh, you're not getting a, a real separation of that uranium uh, from the overall material. However, uh, with our technology's ability to break apart that mineral patina coating, as you can see in this example, uh, we were able to recover 92% of the uranium and just 13% of the overall mass. And so in the case, they all kind of describe what those implications are. And we've been working with um, several different universities and other private partners. Uh, we do have a, a, a verification study that we did with Idaho National Labs as well on a uranium waste rock pile. Um, and this just shows that process flow diagram of, of how that would work. So we would take that um, material, so like in an abandoned uranium mine that has that waste rock, uh, the, the pumps in our technology um, are limited by size. So we would need to get that material to a certain size. And then here, these collisions uh, happen um, and, and certain materials require uh, more collisions. And then we would separate it based off of size. And then we can recycle uh, the water that we're using back into the process. And then we would separate uh, into two different piles. One that has that uranium and other uh, constituents that concern concentrate. And then with the clean coarse sand um, for this particular application. So, you know, stepping back big picture, in the United States, uh, the US EPA estimates that there are over 15,000 abandoned uranium mines. 75% uh, of those abandoned uranium mines are on federal, uh, federal and tribal lands. Um, and the issue is a lot of uh, a lot of these mines were, you know, mined um, under the Atomic Energy Commission uh, to support Cold War efforts. Uh, you know, between the 1940s to 1980s, largely, and and that material has just continued to reside on the surface. And so what happens? Uh, when that material sits on the surface for several decades, it begins to oxidize, it can uh, enter population centers, um, get into um, drinking water, so it has uh, significant uh, health effects. Um, on the Navajo Nation alone, there are 523 abandoned uranium mines that have been identified um, where solutions are being investigated, including our technology as a potential solution uh, to help clean those uh, sites up. Um, and for those impacted communities. And a lot of studies have been conducted showing the negative effects of, of having that material sit on the surface near these communities um, for such an extent of time. Because right now, you know, the current condition is, is to do nothing. Um, and the only other real alternatives are to transport 100% of the material offsite to disposal facilities. But, you know, when you look at the sheer magnitude of, of some of these sites, it's literally moving mountains and just taking the problem and moving it from one location to the next. Uh, and then there's um, taking the, that waste rock and putting it into uh, um, uh, capping um, that material on site and liners. Uh, but those have uh, you know potential negative consequences as well. So you know with with the ability that we had described in the prior slides of being able to um, separate you know 90 to in some cases 99 percent of the uranium and other um, constituents that concern into a fine fraction, you can take that offsite uh, and, and dispose of it. So now instead of disposing of a million tons, you know, and, and that example would be disposing of a hundred um, a thousand tons uh, with that 90% um, reduction in the overall mass that's now contaminated, uh, or you can recycle it um, and be converted to U308 um, and, and enter the nuclear fuel chain, depending on um, 
on, on the um, plan for that particular site. So this is an example. This is a private site. Uh, it's a it's a uranium mine that was mined in the late 1970s. Uh, this is a low grade waste rock. So it's got about a thousand parts per million uranium, uh, three thousand parts per million vanadium. There's 8,500 tons of this material, and it's just been sitting um, on the surface. Even when uranium was at $120 a pound, it still wasn't economic uh, for this particular owner to transport that material and have it recycled at a mill uh, and dispose of as alternative feed. Uh, but where our technology comes even um, in a lower price uh, environment, uh, we could economically go um, and remediate this site appropriately, significantly reduce the radiological signature at the site, um, and, and then uh, productively recycle that those uranium vanadium uh, minerals. So this just gives some more data um, showing how there's an overall reduction on uh, the entire radiological signature um, from all RICRA metals, uh, from you know, radium-226 to thorium-230, uh, we, we are reducing all of, all of those um, you know, uh, items of concern into that fine fraction that can be disposed of or recycled. And so this just shows what the overall site is. Uh, this is for that site in that prior image. Um, the public exposure limits are 25 millirems per annum. Um, and after uh, in this um, model, by removing um, you know, the radium-226 and the uranium uh, from this particular site, uh, we were getting about 90% removal. Um, we reduced those annual dose, um, dose down to 8.8 .8 millirem per annum. So uh, two thirds below the regulatory uh, standard for someone to, to be able to go and um, uh, spend significant amount of time on that land. So now this land can be uh, turned back to productive use. People can recreate on this land uh, and it's no longer a, a public um, uh, public issue and uh, concern. Um, stepping away from uh, the abandoned um, uranium and uranium waste rock uh, processing, uh, another application that we've uh, spent a lot of time on is um, for iron. So this is a site uh, that's got 8 million tons of iron tailings. Uh, it's been, um, those tailings have been present here since uh, World War II uh, when this mine was last active. And so that we've been working with the mine owner to see if we can um, liberate um, the iron so that he can get a higher upgrade on those tailings to, uh, to put this product um, to market. And so this just shows a pilot of, of what our um, footprint would look like at this particular site. Uh, here was a study that we did with the University of Wyoming. Um, this is SEM imaging. Um, the, on the image on the left is the feed material before we go through our system. And those that um, those lighter uh, colors are um, the hematite that's uh, rich in that iron. Um, and you can see how that's still attached to the primary host grain. So after running it through our system is where we're able to have that effective liberation. And you can see in the post hypsum material uh, where those, those, that lighter material has been effectively liberated from the host grain. So it makes it easier for separation. And um, we're actually uh, working with, with this miner in the University of British, of, uh, British Columbia right now uh, to find ways to uh, most economically uh, separate that, that hematite for those higher upgrades right now. So that mine owner can um, put those tailings to productive use. And then again, on, on graphite, um, this isn't for a tailings application, but just to highlight the liberation again, um, comparing our technology to a polishing mill. In this example, um, that polishing mill is getting a, a, a grade of 55% and 96% recovery. Um, but using our technology, instead of that polishing mill, we were able to improve the grade um, by nearly 20% with um, similar recoveries and uh, having a higher graphite flake size, um, which is more important because uh, the, the higher the graphite flake, the, um, the more it's worth. And then so rare earths have, have been um, you know, quite important. This just gives a brief overview of, of some work we've done with rare earths, especially given uh, how, how much um, rare earths we import to the United States every year. This is a project here in the United States we've been working with. And then the last one that I'll touch on is, um, uh, this was a gold mine. Uh, they've got 100 million tons worth of tailings uh, that have been sitting at, at this site here on this beach on the right for um, several decades. And what we're working with this mine owner is to uh, upgrade uh, the, the quartz product left in those tailings uh, to potentially be used for frac sand and then take the other streams uh, for productive use as well. So just benchmarking our technology against an attrition scrubber, uh, we, we got both higher grades and recoveries. 
Um, we're still in the optimization phase, uh, but you know, getting close to what those frac sand specs are, um, where where that quartz could actually be used um, for for an ulterior um, purpose. So excited about that project, and um, yeah, happy to discuss more. But um, you know, really uh, just thrilled to be here and, and part of this conversation. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Grayson. And uh, we've had several questions from the participants about um, how do you, how do you bring in the indigenous leaders into this conversation, and particularly since you're working on um, abandoned uranium mines on Navajo property, if you could talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Deborah. So um, you know, in addition to our, our work that we highlighted at a private site, um, we are working on a treatability study. Um, uh, with US EPA and Navajo Nation EPA is a um, supporting agency uh, to look at how effective our technology is on helping address the, the issue um, of cleaning up those abandoned uranium mines. So we have a, a, a Navajo partner, Bitco company that we do all of the work with um, and have continued to interact with Navajo EPA. If um, you have several uh, discussions with the Diné Uranium uh, Commission um, on our technology and uh, it's something that that's very important to us and, and we spent a lot of time with and you know really the the largest passion in our company is to to be able to use our technology to solve that issue um because when when you look at the negative health effects and and how you know this problem has just remained unsolved for for so long it's um you know we're excited that we may have a potential solution that um you know can, can solve or at least help facilitate um you know a, a solution for that significant problem Okay, thank you. Um, so now we'll move on to general questions um, from the board. Panelists can ask other panelists uh, questions. And um, I'm, I'm gonna throw out one general question to all of you and whoever wants to answer it. Um, and what are some of the problems and challenges that you face when you're reprocessing mind healings? I, I can jump in there for um, uh, abandoned uranium mines in particular. Um, I think it's laws that were passed several decades ago, keeping up with new and innovative technologies. Um, for example, we applied for a radioactive materials license to be able to possess um, uranium with the state of Colorado uh, over a year ago. Uh, to be able to use our technology for remediation of the thousands of sites that are in Colorado and uh, there's a, a you know the 1954 Atomic Energy Act has a, a particular clause in there um, that never foresaw a, a technology like ours that would you know concentrate uranium but leave that that um, what we're calling the coarse fraction significantly cleaner um, and so the state of Colorado you know unfortunately and kind of boggled the mind interpret the process of our technology is being classified as milling and not remediation we now now have a license in front of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission right now, um, but just being uh, thwarted by you know, laws that, that were passed 70 years ago um, that are still in effect that aren't um, you know, recognizing the, the significant progress of technology. Okay, and Ed, I'm gonna ask you the, the same question, but from a maybe a tailings dam and disturbance of tailings and some of the technological issues that are faced. Um, well, there's a materials handling issue. P pumping the stuff out of these dams is not uh, uh, trivial. Uh, and then you've got to be able to leach it in a reasonable um, in a reasonable time frame so that it's economic, which uh, is not always possible. So, and it depends obviously on what type of tailing it is. Uh, generally, I, I work with sulfides. The sulfide tailing uh, can be difficult to process technologically. That's why we've had so much trouble with calcopyrite over the years. Um, and so, yeah, there, there's a myriad of issues around the actual metallurgy of extracting any value from it, which is why uh, for cleaning up, I think, unfortunately, the government is gonna have to step step up, at least I'll speak for, uh, for the Canadian, as a Canadian, the Canadian government's gonna have to step up and, and incentivize some of these activities because um, they don't make sense economically without that intervention. Okay, and I have a question for McKinsey from one of our previous panelists from Nadal Nasser. Um, he wants to know um, why stibnite production is going to drop off after 
six years of the STEM Night Goal project? Well, well, and that's a great question. So thank you. So our STEM Night mineral resource is very much associated with the gold resource on site. So as we are going after the highest grade gold, which is in the Yellow Pine Pit and the Hanger Flats Pit or areas of site, that also just happens to be where the highest concentrations of antimony are. And so they're very much associated with one another. There is another kind of separate geological um, event at site where with the West End Pit um, that is not mineralized with antimony, but with gold. So the remainder of the project is really focused then in the remain in the final years on that resource. And I will also say, you know, that most of the work that we've done on site wasn't focused on identifying all of the components of the antimony resource on site. Instead, we were focused on the economics of the project, which is which is very honestly with gold. But we do believe that there are additional opportunities for more production of stibnite or antimony from the project if it gets moving forward. Okay, thank you. Um, are there questions from the board? Okay, Harvey Miller has a question. Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, Grayson talked about this a bit in his um, presentation, but I'd like to get a better picture of this. Um, how carbon intensive are these remining activities? I mean, how much carbon are we burning in order to make this transition to a carbon free world? And that may be a naive question, but it's okay. Talk to me like I'm naive. I will jump in there uh, just briefly, and I can only talk about it from a very general standpoint. Um, you know, we haven't done a full carbon analysis on the overall impact of our project to date. However, what I do know is that here in Idaho, we get to take advantage of one of the lowest carbon energy net energy systems already because Idaho is so heavily powered with hydro. Um, so that brings our overall carbon just from the energy from our you know, first scope that we're drawing on with their project down to a pretty reasonable rate compared to many other gold projects in the country. From an offset perspective, though, when we look at just how much the carbon offset is of our partnership with the battery company, it's almost a 20 fold benefit. Um, from the impact of the project compared to the 20 year lifespan of these of the batteries and what carbon offset comes from that use. And I'm sorry, I don't have more specific numbers on hand, but it is something we're looking at and trying to evaluate. You know, I'll, I'll answer that too real quickly for, you know, looking at our um, application specifically, all, all we need is a, a limited amount of electricity. Um, so it depends on what that electricity output would be. But you know, when you're looking at the alternatives, um, there's a significant reduction in carbon for the remediation. Uh, one of the largest costs um, and, and highest uh, outputs of GSG is just the transportation to take all these trucks, you know, pick up millions of tons of material and then move them all the way back. So you know, in the examples that I provided by reducing um, the amount of material by 90% that would have to be hauled off site, that's 90% less vehicles on the road going back and forth. So um, you know, not only is that a reduction in, in carbon output, but um, also you know, uh, potential uh, accidents and, and less vehicles on the road as well. So, And then the ability to have a product that's been sitting on the surface for several decades that's of no use to where you know, in certain cases, there's high enough grades of uranium that it can be recycled to, to ultimately, you know, be used for, for nuclear power, so. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question is from Nelia Dumba. Um, yes, I have a fairly detailed technical question for Edward. And you showed in one of your slides uh, two nice SEM images, one showing calcopyrite with a passivation layer and the other that's been depassivated. And, you know, one is very, very smooth and the other has a, you know, quite a bit of topography. Um, and I'm curious, uh, is, the, is the dissolution of pirate, is the, the passivation layer, is that purely a physical phenomenon or is there a geochemical overlay on top of that? So when the calcopyrite becomes, you know, passivated, are there, are there physical and chemical processes going on or is it purely a physical process? 
Well, it's an electrochemical process. So pyrite oxidation and calcopyrite oxidation, most sulfide oxidations are electrochemical. Um, and in this case, so you're going to have a physical and, and a chemical aspect to this. Uh, the passive film, so calcopyrite is generally an N-type semiconductor. And the passive film is a is an, a P-type, so it's an NP junction. It's a, basically a diode that forms on the surface of the of the calcium Okay. Um, yeah, okay. And, and so you need something to break that down, um, and that can happen on geochemical timeframes with bacteria, you know, over over hundreds of years, uh, or we can speed it up using the catalyst that we use. Thank you very much. That was an interesting talk, also. And Deborah, my hand seems to be. I'm locked up here, so I can't lower my hand. That will mean you have to ask more questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the next uh, question is from Alan Mark. Yes, thank you. Uh, my question is for Grayson. I think I'm misunderstanding something. I, I think I heard you say twice, volume reduction of the waste material by up to 90%. Uh, that strikes me as really strange. Maybe I'm misinterpreting that, but I, I, you know, I, I look at it, I interpret what you're saying is if I have a ton of material in the waste pile, I go through your process and I end up with 0.1 tons of waste product to get rid of. That seems astounding. Yes, and, and that's why we're, we're so excited about the economic implications. Let me pull this slide up real quick that I didn't touch on. Um, so this could be a potential recycle value chain of um, we were discussing, so, you know, this particular pile, you know, here we're assuming this 0.1% uranium, um, you know, we would process that um, waste rock to the two separate piles. So 90% is now clean enough to be, to be left as um, stable um, backfill on that site because we've reduced the radiological signature to meet all regulatory um, thresholds. And then the 10% is that concentrated material. So that's where, um, you know, in 90 to 90 and in, in some of our tests, 99% of the uranium and other constituents of concern have, have ended up. And so that 10% can then be um, disposed of or um, recycled. Um, and then, so the rest, you know, now we've reduced that to below, in this case, you know, 0.01% uranium that can remain on site. So, um, you know, we're, we're still uh, in doing the investigation with uh, US EPA and Tetra Tech on um, the treatability study that we're doing in the Navajo Nation, but past tests that we did with Navajo EPA, um, you know, if we, we were able to, certain um, samples that had you know, 150 parts per million uranium, reduce that down to the single digits of um, parts per million uranium in that clean coarse fraction. And that's where like 90% uh, of that overall mass is. So um, ho hopefully that makes sense on, on how that, that separation works. So, you know, we're not recovering 100% of the uranium, but we're, we're removing enough um, into those fines that that clean coarse fraction um, can, can remain on site and meet those regulatory thresholds. So the 90% applies to how much uranium was in the original waste material, which might've been a small fraction of the original waste material. You still got sands or whatever else it is that's uh, a waste product, I would call it, that's 90 to 90% 90 or more that you gotta do something with. You're assuming that that can be beneficially reused in some way, right? Well, that 90% that of the, that overall mass, yeah. So like when we're looking at these sites, only 0.05% of that site would have uranium in it. So yeah. when I say we reduce 90% it's for that overall site, not just the uranium, but we are removing those amounts of um, uranium as well. So, yeah, one of the things, just a point that I think in a lot of these recycling things, we're still left with a lot of volume of material that at the end we've got to do something with. And some of it may be high water content materials that, um, that present their own set of uh, disposal problems. Right, yeah, because like in, in our example, if you had a, a million tons, 100,000 tons of that would still have, you know, need to be dealt with. And, and that's where you it could be disposed of or, or you know, recycled. Um, well, I'm still confused there. That, that's implying that you're starting with like 90% or whatever that waste pile was, is recoverable uranium. That, that strikes me as not right. I'm, I'm missing misunderstanding. So yeah, and, and I'm happy, we could talk offline too, if, if you want, but um, yeah, sorry, sorry, that's not more clear. I can, I can show this as one quick, more overview. So, you know, this shows, you know, with, with the typical grade, so this is the uranium and then the gray is the overall mass. So, you know, there's 0.05% uranium. Of that 0.05%, 
we're recovering 92% of that um, and just 13% of the overall mass. So got this it, is the, I'm, I'm, I'm that focused on the other piece that's the largest portion. And what do we do with that? Right. That that is now right. clean enough. Um, so that that can be that's that's clean enough. So uh, source materials, anything below 500 parts per million uranium. Those dose assessments that we had is 25 millirem per annum for that one particular site. Uh, it's now eight millirem per annum uh, is what we got the dose assessment down to for that site. So it's it's safe enough for people to recreate on that land. Um, and so, so it, it's been significantly below those standards. So it can't yeah, be no, remaining. You're, on looking you're looking at it from the perspective of uranium exposure, but there might still be other issues, just getting rid of this volume of clay sized particles, sand sized particles that have a lot of water in them. So I, yeah. I'll move on. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Isabel Montanez has a question. Can you, um, can we hear you? Yeah. Or do you want me to ask? No, I, I can go back to it. I'm, I'm kind of uh, shifting the um, direction. So I was actually maybe best if we finish questions on the actual process of, of, and environmental impacts because mine has to do with the workforce. You're okay with me moving in that way? Yeah, that'd be great. So I'm going back to what something that Warren said, which was the choke point um, is the expertise. And something that's crossed my mind many a time is, um, do we have a sense for in the US and in Canada, we could include uh, how many academic entities are prepared or preparing themselves to address the workforce needs that are gonna be related um, to this continued mining that we're talking about, but also of course the remining of the, of the future. Where do we stand you know, in that sense? Just like policy might be a bit ahead of process for some of the issues we, we need to discuss um, what, how are we with the workforce development? And I'll add to that question. I know that um, many of the traditional mining schools no, no longer offer mineral processing. Those programs have gone away. So it's, it's a big issue. But Ed, maybe you can address that for us. Yeah, it used to be that just about every research intensive university in Canada had a mining and metallurgy department. Uh, now there are basically three. Uh, so uh, UBC, uh, Queens and McGill and to a certain extent, the University of Alberta, but they focus on oil and gas. So um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a challenge. One thing that, you know, ANSERC, which is our funding agency is, is pretty good at funding uh, mining and metallurgy um, research. I've heard anecdotally that, that NSF in the States is not as good at doing that. And so uh, that may be something uh, that should be advocated for because um, that's how we train people is by doing the research. Um, and there's the added benefit of potentially innovating. So um, that's what I can say about that. And do you know um, about the US higher ed and what's going on there? Again, it's pretty limited. You know, there was a time, for example, where Columbia had a pretty big department in mining uh, and metallurgy, and, and now that's um, that's dwindled. I, I knew that they were trying to hire someone at some point. Um, there's a few schools out west. Uh, some of them have been mentioned here today, but it's much smaller than it used to be, definitely. And one of the things is that it's not attractive for students to get into the field we it's it's got a bad reputation and as such it's it's hard to get people in um, so we have to we have to switch that viewpoint which i think is something that mckinsey was talking about i could just speak for the usgs and uh, our experience and i happen to be sitting at the colorado school of mines right now um, and so we work very closely with them uh, on uh, 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 trying to develop the future workforce. We also have partnerships with other universities. And again, we rely heavily on our state geological survey partners. I mean, Neely is down in New Mexico. So they've got a phenomenal program bringing in new people. But we have to kind of grow our own, right? Geophysicists out there who understand a potential field geophysics. There really aren't that many schools. There are like a handful, maybe one or two professors that actually uh, do research in that and to, uh, geared towards the mineral exploration community. And so we're basically bringing in people and we find it very hard to find the right candidates through our Mendenhall postdoc program, uh, as well as uh, students to work with our own employees 
so that, that we can start growing our own workforce. It's, it's, it's inefficient, but that's, that's where we are. You know, and I would also add to that, that I think in mining today, we have a representation problem. We need more women. We need more minorities and people of color and people from diverse backgrounds into this industry, or it will not thrive. And getting into schools at a very early age to say, there are opportunities for you here that are high tech, that are based in science, that are outdoors, that can help provide good um, on the things that you care about is a really important first step as well. There is a workforce shortage coming at us where we don't have the expertise. And until we start showing this next generation that they are welcome and needed, and that this is a career opportunity that you can grow in, it's gonna be a real challenge for the industry. So I know that there's some legislation being introduced in US Congress um, for mining education. But I don't know the details. Maybe someone on this um, call knows what's going on there. Anyone? All right, it's something we'll look at. Uh, Deborah, would, I don't see any other hands. Can I go back to the question that was uh, put in here regarding indigenous uh, uh, peoples? Um, it's so Earth MRI, USGS activities. We we are on the front end side. We're doing geologic mapping, uh, lidar, et cetera. And a lot of those areas, you know, the rocks don't care who owns the surface rights. They just are, right? And so um, we do an awful lot of work reaching out to the individual tribal members, uh, tribes uh, uh, that we would potentially do a new project in, and we engage them right up front. And uh, to ask them if they would like to be part uh, participants. Now, what I found is it's not a one size fits all response. They're all not anti mining, they're all not pro mining. It, they're in, individual uh, entities, uh, uh, you know, independent nations. Um, and so we just have to work and spend time developing those relationships to. Uh, um, get to the point where, yes, you can work on our area or no, you can't. And it, we don't care one way or the other. We just want to make sure that we have the opportunity to provide the data to those uh, areas that are underserved, quite frankly, in geosciences. Um, and so, it, you know, there's, there's a lot of, lot of conversations that happen uh, to try and bring a level of comfort and understanding of what kinds of data we can develop and their uses uh, beyond just the mineral exploration. I mean, it's it's actually a good geologic map is uh, it can be used for so many different things. It's good LIDAR data, uh, geo, uh, geohazards issues, you know, so all kinds of applications for the things we do. But that really is a great question. And it really has to be addressed up front uh, as we go into uh, projects. Thank you, Warren. Um, Eleanor, another question. Yeah, just that just provoked me to think a little bit. You know, we do a lot of writing on on these exciting ideas to ourselves, to our own community, not very much directed at young people. Uh, how do we do a better job of that? How do we, we got to do something to get a broader audience and get excitement and enthusiasm um, early. I don't know how to do it. I can see the need though. Yeah, good comment. I failed so, with my two children. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I will honestly say it takes show and tell. The more we can show people and children how we do, how we mine, what we're mining for, what it looks like, what it looks like to be a miner today, what a mine site looks like, the more we can bring the public into what we're doing, especially at a young age, the more successful we will be in doing just that. I've taken my kids up you know, to the mine site at Stib Night and their eyes get real big and they're like, wow, those are giant trucks. That looks really, really cool. Um, and then my oldest now, you know, she's in high school and now the conversation is more about, well, why is it important to do this here? Why, if we're gonna be using these products, why do we have a responsibility to, to make sure that we're doing it here the right way? And so again, it's showing and telling, it starts with rocks in classrooms. It starts with making those connections. 
between what those rocks become that we use and the types of careers that can, can really be lifelong in this industry. And I get excited about it. I think you spend a little time in a classroom and, and kids light up and they see something that, that no one's there telling them today they have an opportunity to do. Thanks. So we, we have an audience question for the, um, the three process companies. Um, how quickly can your proposed applications be implemented? And what would you need to get these positive remining projects going more quickly? What's the biggest hurdle to effective implementation? So um, we'll do, do a round here. How about Ed McKinsey and Grayson? Uh, so on, on the jetty side, because it's targeted to existing mining facilities, brownfield sites that have existing infrastructure, and all you're doing is building a, uh, a small storehouse for the catalyst, um, as long as you know that it's going to work in, a, in that particular instance, I mean, it's a, it's a you know a three month kind of construction project. Uh, so it, that's pretty fast. The, the thing that takes the, the time is the column what we do ahead of time, which is the research work to make sure it's going to actually work when it's applied. And that, that can take sort of three to six months. Um, so you're looking at probably six, six to 12 months max uh, for, some, for a project that has all the existing infrastructure. Great. And that, that's the advantage is you don't need new permitting. Uh, correct. Yeah. Although in some jurisdictions, they may look at, at, at the catalyst and permitting the use of the catalyst. But generally speaking, the large, the large pieces of the mine are already there. Okay. And McKinsey? That's a great question. It's also a complicated question. I would say from our standpoint, and this is very much focused on the fact that we're in the middle of the NEPA process. I would say for us, getting to implementation, getting into production is really a matter of, we have a fairly complicated system um, with multiple federal and state agencies. And had we gone in, I think we tried our best, but I think we've learned quite a bit about just basic communication uh, between ourselves and the agencies involved and where overlapping jurisdiction between agencies um, and basic, you know, our project management and how we communicate can, can help a process smooth uh, towards a record of decision. Um, but it will also take appropriate resources uh, to those agencies to make sure that they have the internal resources and the time available. You know, when I look at the infrastructure bill and all of these projects that are coming online, our agencies are going to be overloaded with applications in front of them. So how do we help ensure that we are advocating that they have the right resources from their own technical experts and access to those experts, access to enough people um, and the time to process what we're asking them to process is going to be a choke point uh, that we're all facing. We think it's hard now, if, I look, if you look at all the projects, whether they're mineral or infrastructure based that are potentially coming online, it's gonna be a real challenge. And we've gotta be very focused on, on really making sure that our agencies have the resources they need to help accomplish it. Thanks. Grayson, your biggest hurdle. Yeah, I, I think, you know, there's a few. Um, the largest is status quo bias. I think you know we're we're a new technology, a startup company, and so trying to convince these uh, large companies that have been using the same processes and methods for for decades to uh, consider and adapt a new technology is uh, it's it's a tough ask. And within that comes to these projects are largely capital intensive. So you know once once a company is committed to a particular technology, um, you know they're they're typically in it for for the long haul. And, you know, the, the, the testing does take a while. So we typically will do a testing campaign on a smaller unit. Then we would pilot with that company. And then we would start scaling up to uh, full scale operations. So, you know, if, if the application's a, a smooth fit, it can take as, you know, depending on supply chains and getting parts and everything assembled, you know, as quick as three months to, to have a unit ready to go for an application. Um, or, or it could take several years testing with that partner and optimizing everything perfectly. And then once you throw in regulatory hurdles as well, like, um, you know, what we face on the abandoned uranium mine side, uh, that can also significantly um, 
impede the ability to go out and, and quickly engage in these remediation and, and recycling efforts. Okay. Well, Warren, you started us out today and you get the last word. Well, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for inviting us. Uh, Mackenzie, I just want to echo what you just said about the uh, expertise uh, in the agencies you deal with, with uh, uh, friends of mine at BLM. They're, they're struggling to get uh, mineral examiners uh, to even know anything about it. And so it's, it's a real issue. It is. Uh, and so I, I appreciate what you've said very much. And again, thank you so much. It's been a lot of fun. Okay, we're going to take a break for um, 15 minutes. Thank you.
Hello, and welcome back. And thank you for coming back. We'll, we'll make it worth your while. Uh, our last panel for the day is going to be discussing policy issues associated with green mining, uh, which seems to be flowing nicely from the previous discussions. We're going to start off with presentation uh, from Kyle Danish, who is a partner at Van Ness and Feldman. Kyle, take it away. Hey. Uh, thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Miles, for getting my presentation on the screen. I'm going to start off the panel by providing a review of the policy landscape around critical minerals, uh, generally and as specifically as possible on remining. Um, as many of you probably know, there's quite a bit of activity that's coming out of the Biden administration and the Congress to try to promote domestic production of critical minerals and rare earth elements. And I think it's helpful to understand the different um, tools in the toolbox right now as they may affect people's projects and plans. Let's go to the next slide, please. I'm gonna talk about a couple different types of policies. First, uh, permitting reform. Uh, secondly, a federal, what I would call a demand side incentive for critical minerals, and then supply side funding for uh, deployment to production which takes a couple different forms, tax credits, the Defense Production Act, financing assistance, and grant for a demonstration facility. Throughout, I will make reference to a couple of key laws, um, and I'll use acronyms, so I'm going to give you the, the, full, the full readout now so that we can enjoyably use acronyms for the rest of the presentation. One is the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, um, sometimes known as, as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act or Bill um, Act now, that's from 2021, and then the more recent Inflation Reduction Act, uh, both of which have um, a number of different um, uh, provisions aimed at critical minerals and critical minerals remining. Next slide, please. Uh, first, permitting reform, uh, the IAJA, the Infrastructure Act, directed the Department of Interior and the Department of Agriculture to submit a report that's due pretty soon on measures to increase the timeliness of permitting activities for domestic development of critical minerals. Uh, a lot of this will be focusing on the very ancient 1876 Mining Act and possible reforms. Uh, the Department of Interior formed an interagency working group on this. They, they sent a request for information uh, in March. Uh, and there are 12 questions on that uh, request for information. I'm highlighting two uh, that appear to be pretty relevant for remining. Um, a, a first one about reclamation and specifically calls out the Good Samaritan concept. Um, and then secondly, uh, generally, what would a successful mine reclamation program program include, which I think points to the availability of some of these other policies that I'm going to talk about. This um, uh, uh, request for information drew an extraordinary number and volume of comments, which I think reflects the major national commercial importance of this issue. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. And then, so uh, first policy I'm going to, uh, uh, or next policy I'm going to talk about is a demand side incentive. As many people on the call probably know, the Inf Inflation Reduction Act made some very critical modifications to the tax credit available for electric vehicle purchases. Uh, it conditioned very specifically the, the eligibility to get these credits. Um, uh, on uh, both domestic battery production and domestic critical minerals content in the battery. Uh, the way this was done was it directed the taxpayer here to calculate the value of the critical minerals in the battery that were uh, essentially uh, produced in the U.S. or in a country which, with which the U.S. has a free trade agreement or recycled in the U.S. And that value has to exceed a specific uh, percentage. And in the in in 2020, starting in 2024, these U.S. sourced critical minerals in the battery, the value has to be 40% of the total value of the critical minerals in the battery, and that increases to 80% by 2027. Uh, importantly, starting in 2020. 
five, there's just a total exclusion from the credit if the vehicle contains critical minerals or components sourced from a, quote, foreign entity of concern. First on the list is China. Um, and given the uh, uh, you know, massive control over the supply chain, as probably everyone on this call knows, by China, that's a very meaningful uh, exclusion. And I would say here, there's an interesting link back to my prior slide in that in the request for information on permitting reform ideas, there was an extraordinary participation by automakers. I suspect this was the first time that the Ford Motor Company submitted comments to the Department of Interior about mining policies. But it's a real testament to the importance of this new essentially buy America restriction on the EV tax credits. So again, this affects really the demand side of the equation. So what policies are going to the supply side? Let's go to the next slide. Well, one of them is a production in the same, in the Inflation Reduction Act, there's a production tax credit. Uh, essentially, there's an advanced manufacturing tax credit. And that applies to a lot of different sort of good climate-friendly components and equipment. It also covers critical minerals. So this tax credit uh, is available to for the production and sale uh, by a taxpayer of critical minerals to an unrelated person, i.e. not just to another part of the company. Um, and the credit here is 10% of the production cost. So what that means is that if you develop a uh, uh, critical minerals mining, processing, refining operation, you can get 10% of your production costs uh, a tax credit for 10% of that production cost if you're making a sale to others. A pretty meaningful tax credit uh, for uh, these operations as they come up and running. Next slide, please. Another supply side assistance here is through the Defense Production Act. Um, President signed uh, the Defense Production Act authorization in March 2022, directing the Department of Defense, which obviously has an interest in critical minerals for much of what it does, uh, to consider this list of critical minerals as essential to national security. And it explicitly authorizes the DOD to invest in mine waste reclamation projects. So here is our remining link. Um, Inflation Reduction Act specifically appropriated $500 million for this use of the Defense Production Act. Um, and this is on top of what other, other appropriations the Department of Defense get. The Defense, um, the Defense Production Act is a pretty powerful authority. It basically allows uh, uh, an agency, in this case, the key office at DOD, to just enter into contracts and require um, require that they sit in front of other buyers. Um, there are, it's a pretty powerful set of authorities. The Department of Defense, I think, for the most part, has used this more for end refining uh, investment so far, not so much for, uh, for front-end mining production. But it, this, and I, someone may know something on the phone that I don't about those sort of investments, but my sense it's been a little bit downstream so far. Uh, that they've used this uh, authority for. Um, but this is pretty powerful stuff uh, and a lot of money, and I think it's worth watching. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so another form of government support is financing, not direct money, but, but assistance in essentially uh, loan uh, uh, guarantees. So um, the IAJA, the Investment Act, Investment Infrastructure Act, provided some new authority to the Department of Energy's Loan Programs Office to make loan guarantees to critical minerals projects. This is a new thing. This DOE office has existed for a while to make loan guarantees to clean energy projects, wind, solar, carbon capture. So the addition to, for critical minerals projects is a big new thing. And then the Inflation Reduction Act turned around and gave this office not just for critical minerals, but everything it does, $30 billion. So this is a very um, enriched office that now can make loan guarantees to uh, critical minerals activities. 
So what, what are these loan guarantees? What role do they play? The idea here behind the loan guarantee authority is that banks are typically reluctant to issue debt to early stage innovative projects. Sometimes you can get equity, you can get a part owner. That's not as much fun. You'd rather, you'd rather just have a, a loan that you can repay rather than give up ownership of rights over your activity. But banks don't usually get into that if you're sort of a new thing. So the loan guarantee program is actually a quite an important uh, form of financial support from the federal government. And in a time when interest rates are going up, 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 this is actually a very nice subsidy. Essentially, the government is standing behind uh, any other loan, uh, allowing it to be very low uh, interest rate. Now, the head of this office, uh, a fellow named Jigger Shaw, who's often in the news on clean energy issues, has said that, that for now, they're a bit more focused on the process facilities than the mining operations, but that could change. Uh, so this is another area to watch. Next slide, please. Um, the most direct uh, financing or funding opportunity, I think, that has come out of these various laws um, is in the IAJA, the authority uh, for, um, for a, a direct government grant to a first of a kind rare earth elements, critical minerals demonstration facility involving capable of separating that into mixed rare earth oxides and then into pure oxides of individual rare earth elements. Um, and provide for separation and refining at a single site. This is being, I think, pretty much managed out of the Department of Energy's Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management. Um, last month, uh, this really, this facility process really kicked off. And next slide, please. There's now a funding opportunity announcement um, that's on the street uh, with submission due uh, a little bit later this month. This is going to be, they're contemplating two phases here, and this is for phase one. <clears throat> here, a um, up to eight uh, entities or, or consortia, uh, each led by an academic entity, will get funding to develop a front-end engineering and design study uh, and get a whole host of approvals um, and get pretty far along in their plans. That's what you're going to get funded for if you are awarded uh, a phase one award. Mm -hmm. Then there will be a down select in phase two for one of these, um, you know, people left on the island, as it were, with a rose. There will only be one rose available in phase two. That will be for the big demonstration uh, facility. And of course, the hope is that this will ripen into a big commercial facility and, and get others involved. So uh, that is uh, a high-level tour of the policy landscape, uh, providing demand side and supply side federal support for critical minerals and remining uh, opportunities. Um, I look forward to hearing uh, more from the other panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kyle. Uh, we are going to uh, have all the panelists do the presentations, then we'll do a collective uh, Q&A at the end of the panel uh, rather than interrupt the flow now. So uh, with that, we will go to our next presenter, Steve Feldes, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Land and Minerals Management at the U.S. Department of the Interior. All yours, right. Steve. Thank you very much, Jeff. And and thank you to everyone um, and to the National Academies for uh, inviting me to speak on this panel. So um, as Cal said, my name is Steve Felgus. I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Land and Minerals Management at um, Department of the Interior. And I just wanted to provide some background about what the Department of the Interior is doing right now on mining and also about the administration's support for remining initiatives. And I want to thank uh, Kyle. Sorry, Jeff, for calling you Kyle. I'm getting my name's confused, but thank you, Kyle, for that excellent introduction to uh, a lot of the uh, efforts that the administration is putting into. Obviously, we're you know following the legislative requirements, but also a lot of executive branch initiatives in a lot of different departments 
supporting remining and innovative ways to come up with new sources of critical minerals. Of course, uh, furthering sort of a secondary sources or circular economies and you know, finding new uh, use for say mine waste or abandoned mine lands is, is a very high priority of ours. Um, so shortly after taking office in February 2021, President Biden signed executive order 14017 on America's supply chains. And out of that executive order came these 100 day reports that were released in June of 2021 that was sort of like the initial review of the supply chain issues in the United States uh, in a variety of different areas so batteries, semiconductors, healthcare, and so on. And one of the recommendations coming out of these 100-day reports was for an interagency team to be formed to review the mining laws, regulations, and permitting in the United States and see how we could make improvements. As Kyle mentioned earlier, mining law in this country uh, that really has not been updated at all. So we're still operating, when it comes to mining on public lands in the U.S., under a law that was written in the 19th century, and really that dates back to the California gold rush, because that's what that mining law was built on, was those, those mining codes that were instituted uh, in the field. So, you know, there was a, a lot of, there have been a lot of efforts to reform this over the years. A lot of minerals have been taken out of the mining law, oil and gas, um, sodium, phosphate, these all, uh, used to be in the mining law, and they have been taken out. But for everything else, gold, copper, and all your critical minerals, they are still accessed and developed under this 150-year-old structure. So there is a lot of interest in seeing how can we improve that system on the legislative side, regulatory side, and sort of our policy and process side to make things run smoother and also sort of bring things up to you know how we would hope a modern mining law would behave. So in February of this year, the Department of the Interior formally announced the start of the interagency working group that was recommended under that 100-day report. And I've been helping to lead this process with a, a large crowd of other uh, staff within the Department of the Interior, various bureaus, Bureau of Land Management, Bureau of Indian Affairs, Fish and Wildlife Service, Park Service, and more. And also, um, even, even more so, a lot of different agencies across the federal government are involved in this, the Department of Energy, Environmental Protection Agency, the Forest Service, um, several offices within the Executive Office of the President, like CEQ and, and NEC, have all been engaged in this effort, um, providing staff and helping to discuss these issues and figure out all right, what recommendations can we make to try to improve the system. So the first event that we held was a multi-stakeholder event in the White House on the 150th anniversary of the mining law of 1872. So that was back in May, on May 10th of this year. And that was a, a fantastic event. We brought together the, the mining industry and automakers, okay, I'll also mention those who are engaged in this, but also environmental groups, tribes, states, and uh, other interested parties to really get these ideas out and listen to everyone. And it was a great um, event. And a lot of people in that room said this was the first time that they ever had this diversity of voices at the table at the same time. So that was very promising. And since then, we've been holding dozens of stakeholder engagement meetings, uh, public meetings. We've had nine meetings just with tribes and tribal governments. So we've been hard at work since May. And currently, we are working on putting together our final recommendations, which is going to look at you know, what sort of updates to our laws, regulations, and processes that we can suggest for the agencies and for Congress to consider um, you know, for all these issues across the board. And it's a, it's a huge, huge suite of issues. Um, and as Kyle mentioned, the request for information that we put out back in March mentioned remining issues in two of the questions in there. And um, also this is, this is a big feature of the administration's sort of fundamental principles for mining reform. So at the same time that we announced the working group back in February, we released a document that laid out 11 fundamental principles for mining reform. And you can find those on the Department of the Interior's website. And those included topics like protecting special natural places, strengthening tribal and community outreach, uh, strengthening the agency workforce to make sure that we have the adequate staff that we need to review processes, uh, review applications, I'm sorry, um, making sure that we provide some permitting certainty. And um, there was one point on prioritizing the recycling, reuse, and efficient use of critical minerals 
which encourage developing programs to reprocess mine waste and find other non-traditional sources of minerals. But possibly most relevant to this panel is one principle to establish a fully funded hard rock mine reclamation program, which endorsed Congress providing legal protections for good Samaritans. And let me read the, the relevant paragraph from our document here. There are over 500,000 legacy mining sites in the Western United States alone. Congress should establish a durable program to remediate legacy abandoned hard rock sites and mines and fund the work through reclamation fees, just as occurs with the coal industry and abandoned coal mines. These fees should support well-paying jobs to remediate the environmental impacts of abandoned mine sites and assist in community redevelopment. Good Samaritans working to remediate legacy pollution, including providing for permits and, as appropriate, exemptions from or specialized provisions of environmental laws and regulations that may otherwise, dis otherwise dissuade Good Samaritans from undertaking cleanup activities. This should include consideration of projects which may responsibly extract critical minerals from legacy mine wastes, thereby avoiding the need for additional greenfield mine development. So we dedicated two of our fundamental principles to issues around remining, which I think really emphasizes the support the administration has for this issue. And the interagency working group in response to the request for information that we put out received a large number of comments on Good Samaritan protections. And there was quite a lot of support from a variety of different groups across the spectrum for congressional protect, uh, protections for Good Samaritans. So folks who would go out who are not responsible for the mining pollution, but would go out and help clean these sites up. You're gonna hear more of that from uh, some of our panelists later, including I know, uh, Corey Fisher from Child Unlimited, whose group has been engaged in some of these very activities. Um, I will say though, that while there was a lot of support from a lot of different stakeholders, industry, states, um, a lot of sportsmen groups, it wasn't unanimous. Uh, there was a coalition of 86 tribes and environmental groups that did not support the idea of Good Samaritan protections. And they wrote, quote, we oppose any waiver of core environmental laws, such as the Clean Water Act or the National Environmental Policy Act, end quote. And they also expressed opposition to truncated permitting for things like sampling permits, where companies would go out and test the mine wastes at potential remining sites. So there is some concern out there. And while the administration does support Good Samaritan protections, we want to make sure they're being done in the right way. Now, the Department of the Interior, it turns out, does not actually have many of the equities at stake here because the, li the liability protections that are being sought are under the Clean Water Act and CERCLA, and Interior doesn't have regulatory authority, regulatory authority under either of those. Those are primarily um, the uh, Environmental Protection Agency or the Army Corps. So, um, you know, I'm not the person, certainly the Department of the Interior, uh, is not the agency that can say exactly what the right way is to structure a Good Samaritan program. I mean, the department is still going to review any remining projects on public lands the same way it would review any other project, making sure that it's being protective of the public lands according to the appropriate laws and regulations. And um, they said we, we support the idea and, and we certainly encourage Congress to enact you know, a Good Samaritan protection uh, program in some way. Now, there is something that is a lot more relevant for the Department of the Interior that's not nearly as well known, and that's the issue of mining claims on some of these sites. And if claims have been relinquished from a site, that if a site is no longer mining and the, the company has gone bankrupt or, or relinquished their claims, um, if the lands aren't withdrawn, either by Congress or administratively, people can stake new claims on those. And then for $165 a year, they can hold those claims for as long as they want. So if you have a potential remining site, you might think, great, we can just go out there and propose testing those wastes or, or looking at things that we can do there. But if someone else holds a claim overlying that site, they have the exclusive right to do anything with the minerals on that site. So obviously that's one potential hiccup for anyone looking at you know, remining at, a, at an area, but it's also a problem the department faces when it comes to abandoned mine sites that are, are simply hazardous and that we are trying to address for either safety issues or environmental issues. We have a long history of problems where we try to address issues on abandoned mines, but where someone else has come in and staked a claim 
not one of the original uh, people who is liable for that pollution, but they then prevent us from going in there because they can claim that we would be affecting the economic viability of their claim by going in and doing any cleanup work. So it's not a very widely known feature, but it is something that we have dealt with on quite a few occasions. Um, and you know they, they just simply block us from doing any work on those sites. So uh, obviously it's something we're looking at as part of the interagency working group. Uh, this may require a legislative solution because it's sort of inherent with the mining law of 1872, uh, you know, that, that people may state claims like that, and then they have the ability to keep us from doing work on that. Um, so in the meantime, sort of separately, you're, you're probably aware of a lot of the research work that the administration is doing on this topic. I think Kyle referenced some of that. Uh, you might have heard some of this earlier today. Uh, a lot of that is in the U.S. Geological Survey within Interior or being run by the Department of Energy, as you heard. But I also want to highlight a little additional work that's sort of a, a lesser known program in a, a lesser uh, known agency, and that's the Office of Surface Mining Reclamation and Enforcement. And they are primarily uh, you know, America's coal mine regulators, really. Uh, they, they manage um, you know, mine permitting and abandoned mine cleanup. Uh, throughout the country. You know, they're most active in Appalachia, but they also operate uh, coast to coast. And uh, just a few months ago, they released their applied science grants. And these are, are very small uh, compared to the scale of the Department of Energy or USGS or some other funding programs. Uh, it's only about $200,000 per grant. But they did issue quite a number of those to university researchers to look at better extraction of minerals from coal mine waste or acid mine drainage. So I just wanted to highlight that because that's one of the lesser known uh, agencies and lesser known programs, but it really highlights the sort of, you know, all of government approach that we are trying to address this problem. So with that, I will uh, hand it back to Jeff and I look forward to your questions later. Thank you very much, Steve. Okay, we will move along to Debbie Strusacker. Uh, who uh, helped found the Women's Mining Coalition. And she'll be uh, taking us through the next phase. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, again, I, like the other panelists, want to thank the Academy for including me in this webinar. It's, um, I think we've had an important dialogue and I'm honored to be a part of it. I thought I would start my talk by trying to characterize the scope and nature of the abandoned mine land problem. And we heard Mr. Felgus say that uh, there are 500,000 abandoned mines on federal land. That number is hard to pin down. A, a recent GAO study uh, that was done in 2020 shows that there are um, you know, roughly 141,000 abandoned mines on public lands. I mean, it's probably not worth arguing about the exact number. It's a big problem any way you slice it. But I think it's important to try to characterize the nature of the problem, because according to this GAO study, the lion's share of abandoned mines are either safety hazards or we don't know what kind of hazard they present, um, with just 16% of um, abandoned mines posing an environmental problem. Now, sites with safety hazards are not mutually exclusive with sites that have environmental problems. Often they coexist. But I think it's important when we're talking about this problem is to understand that safety hazards pose the most immediate threat to people, whereas environmental problems pose a more immediate threat to wildlife. And I've been involved with this um, Remining and AML Good Samaritan issue for, uh, well, like Warren Days, since the mid 1990s. And uh, through those decades, the principal focus of Good Samaritan legislative proposals have really focused like a laser beam on how do we solve the environmental problems. And I, I think that that focus has. Um, well, first of all, it hasn't been very productive. I mean, we've we've been um, having this policy dialogue with relatively little success for nigh on three decades now. And I, I would suggest to you that, you know, it kind of uh, resembles the definition of insanity, which is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So I 
think that that focus has stymied our progress on fixing sites that are primarily safety hazards and fixing sites that have maybe less complex environmental problems. Um, so the kinds of things that can be done to abate safety hazards are really quite straightforward. Um, you can partially or completely backfill mine openings or put um, a gate, um, a bat gate, a bat friendly gate across them. Um, you can surround them with fences and signs that warn people to stay out and you can remove unsafe structures and buildings. Environmental problems, much more um, complex, um, but not all of them are super complex. Uh, some of the remediation techniques can be pretty straightforward, like moving a drainage away from a mine waste pile or removing the mine waste pile and placing it in a modern engineered containment structure or constructing a cover or a cap over a mine waste pile so that you limit the infiltration of meteoric waters into that pile. Um, you can develop water treatment systems. Um, you can reprocess to recover minerals, which is a form of source reduction, which is of course a um, excellent way to remediate an environmental problem. And again, um, you can plug mine openings that have mine drainage, and that's often a very challenging situation. I'd like to suggest that remining doesn't mean solely reprocessing, um, that reprocessing is a subset of remining, and that some of these other um, techniques like removing mine waste out of a drainage and putting it in a new um, engineered containment structure, that is also a form of remining. So I think it would, might be better for us to think about remining in a broader context, and it's not solely restricted to reprocessing the rate waste. Now that, of course, reprocessing is what we were talking about here as a source of uh, minerals and critical minerals. So on the policy um, arena, we are fortunate right now that there is a bill that's um, being debated in Congress. It's Senate Bill 3571. It's sponsored by a number of bipartisan sponsors. It's got a lot of sponsors, but it was introduced by New Mexico Senator Heinrich and Idaho Senator Risch. And it's seeking to develop 15 pilot projects to remediate um, some of the more simple AML sites that don't have really, really complex environmental problems. And those of us who have been working on this AML um, Good Samaritan issue for decades, we're encouraged by this bill. It's not a panacea, it's limited in focus, but I think it's a good start. Um, also, I believe this policy discussion should start looking at ways to address the liability issues associated mainly with securing hazardous mine openings that, again, may not have much of an environmental problem. That's certainly true for um, projects in the arid west. I'm from Nevada, and there are a lot of sites here that are safety problems, but because of the dry climate, they don't typically um, represent uh, significant environmental issues as well. Um, I think a really important aspect of the policy dialogue surrounding AML cleanups and remining is that we cannot let pursuit of the perfect be the enemy of the good. At these sites, um, like the Stibnite site that McKinsey Lyon described, we are not starting with a clean slate. And so we have to have realistic um, concepts about what can be done there, what is feasible to be done there. And I believe that those policy dialogues have to encourage, allow and encourage incremental cleanups that result in environmental progress. They may not be an entire cleanup, but some cleanup is certainly better than no cleanup. And no cleanup is where we are right now. And it's where we've been for 30 years. And that is simply um, an unsustainable status quo. Um, I've been talking to um, Stephen D'Esposito, who's the CEO of Resolve Regeneration. And he uses a, a phrase that I think is very useful, which is that we should be viewing AML cleanup projects through a net positive lens. 
we should ask ourselves, does the project have the potential to achieve an overall environmental benefit? And that might mean that water quality issues might still exist at the project, but habitat issues, say, could be improved or safety issues can be improved. And so is there a net environmental benefit that are proposed um, AML cleanup and, and at some in some cases, remining projects can achieve? Um, I think it's also really important to understand that there are projects that are likely to to be good sources of critical minerals. I mean, we heard about a beautiful example at Stibnite Gold where there, the, um, there's antimony that is um, basically co-hosted with the gold deposit there. And I, you know, I'm well convinced that that's not a one-off situation, that there are going to be other um, AML sites where there's um, significant residual mineral values that could be attractive to the private sector and that um, redevelopment of those sites could achieve a cleanup of those sites. But I think at this point, after 30 years of talking about Good Samaritan relief for these very complex kinds of projects, we haven't been able to find that solution. And I'd like to suggest to you that the policy dialogue about some of these more complex environmental problems, and again, those might be sites with residual mineral values and critical minerals, we need to develop other kinds of policy incentives that um, enable the uh, private sector to make the enormous investment that is required to remediate that kind of site. And it, it, I'm of the opinion that it's not liability relief. It needs to be something different, like perhaps permit streamlining or other kinds of incentives that give the private sector enough encouragement and security of tenure to know that they can develop that project. Um, I, don't, I don't believe McKinsey mentioned this, but it's in um, Perpetua's public documents. Uh, they are proposing to invest a billion dollars of private sector money to reclaim, restore, and reclaim that site. I'll say that again, it's a billion dollars. So that kind of investment is huge. It's really significant. And, you know, if the private sector isn't there to make that investment, I don't see anybody else waiting in the wings to make that significant commitment to try to better that site. So as part of the AML reclamation remining dialogue, we have to be able to acknowledge and support that for the private sector to take a primary role in doing this, they have to be allowed to make a profit. And the concerns about remining generating a profit have completely stymied the uh, Good Samaritan reclamation dialogue for about the last 30 years. Um, the last thing I'd like to say is that we've heard um, Kyle and Steve talk about the mining law and talk about how old it is and kind of infer that it needs to be changed. The mining law is mainly a law that deals with how citizens can locate claims on public lands and have security of tenure to be able to be on the land long enough to explore for minerals and develop them. Security of tenure is absolutely essential if you're looking to invest a billion dollars to redevelop and restore a site. So there are aspects of the mining law, the land tenure elements of it that I believe are an underlying premise that must remain in place. Um, there have been a lot of dialogue with the um, interagency working group and the request for information that um, Steve described that looks, there's posing questions about should the claim system be jettisoned and in a, a leasing system put in place. I will tell you that if that happens, there won't be private sector investment in AML sites because you won't have the security of tenure that is needed to warrant the investment it's gonna to take to redevelop and reclaim a site. Um, 
I also want to suggest that for sites that actually have active mining claims, those are not abandoned sites. They have an owner. And I know at least here in Nevada, the Nevada Division of Environmental Protection has the necessary regulatory tools to compel a claim owner to secure his or her mine site. So the land status at many AML sites is really complex. And if there are claim claimants who are actively paying their annual claims maintenance fee, that's not an abandoned site. And they, they need to know that they are there at that site and potentially are going to be um, asked by land management agencies or other regulators to do something about the problems that are there. Now, a lot of historic AML sites have a very complex land status. Many of them have a core of what were patented claims. And if there's still an owner for those patented claims, then that's not an abandoned site either. There's an owner who, in theory, could be compelled to help fix the site. But there are also a lot of sites where those patented claims are no longer you know, on the taxpaying rolls, and those indeed are abandoned sites. So just wanted to add that sort of land tenure and land status complexity into the dialogue, because that's a pretty important consideration at any um, other site. So... I think with that, I will turn the microphone over to, <clears throat> excuse me, to Corey. And thank you again for um, inviting me to participate in this in this uh, dialogue today. Libby, thank you very much for uh, for adding to the session. Uh, we'll bring up our last speaker, as you mentioned, Corey Fisher, Public Land Policy Director for Trout Unlimited's Angler Conservation Program. Um, so just want to confirm that you do have the um, slide deck up. There it is. Stand by. Uh, thank you. Um, thanks for the introduction and opportunity to, to be here today. Um, yes, my last name is Fisher and I work for Trout Unlimited, so you can score a point for, for serendipity there. Uh, based in Missoula, Montana, and I've been with Trout Unlimited for uh, about 18 years now, and I work within our uh, government affairs program on uh, public land issues, including um, mining and uh, abandoned mine land policy. Um, if you want to go ahead to the next slide there, please. Uh, so just first a little bit about Trout Unlimited. We're a nationwide grassroots uh, conservation organization with a mission to bring together diverse interests to care for and recover rivers and streams so our children can experience the joy of wild and native trout and salmon. Uh, we're comprised of about 300,000 uh, grassroots members and supporters who are part of a nationwide network of almost 400 uh, local chapters. Um, amongst our peers and kind of the conservation uh, organization NGOs, uh, we're kind of unique in that we have a uh, both a very robust um, uh, restoration arm of the organization with uh, project managers that conduct restoration projects, including abandoned mine land restoration projects uh, throughout the country. And then we also have our uh, policy and advocacy arm of our organization of which uh, I work in. A good example of that duplicity, uh, uh, right here we have Lauren Duncan, who's our Colorado um, uh, abandoned mine land coordinator testifying uh, before a House Natural Resources Committee on um, uh, mining reform and Good Samaritan legislation, uh, coupled with her work in the field there, uh, working to, to clean up some abandoned mines. Um, on the restoration side, uh, since 2004, we've restored nearly 200 miles of streams degraded by abandoned mines in uh, six Western states. Um, so it, it, currently our work is primarily focused in Colorado and Montana, 
Um, though we do have uh, some work in Idaho as well, and hopefully some emerging opportunities as some of the policy levers and funding hopefully come into play. Um, and in all of this work, I uh, really want to emphasize that partnerships are key. Partnerships with state agencies, federal agencies, tribes, the mining industry, um, other non-governmental organizations are really important for, for getting this work done and bringing the expertise and resources necessary. Uh, next next slide, please. So, um, you know, why does this all matter? Uh, you know, as, as, as Debbie mentioned, estimates vary, but by some estimates, there's 33,000 sites polluting the environment right now. Um, that's from a government accountability office report. Um, and the EPA estimates that 40% of the Western uh, headwater streams are polluted by drainage from abandoned hard rock mines. Trot Unlimited conducted our own analysis and found that um, uh, 110, 000, approximately 110,000 stream miles are listed for heavy metals and acidity, um, and uh, you know abandoned mines are a significant source of that pollution. And of those streams, 20% are important for native trout fisheries, and 30% of those impaired stream miles um, are uh, surface drinking water sources. So. This really is a huge problem, um, and regardless of which estimate um, you may prefer, uh, tens of thousands of these sites are out there polluting the environment. But uh, you know, I think with the right policy tools and funding, um, we we are able to can be able to address this problem at the scale it demands. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of those examples of addressing this problem uh, is our first project that Trout Unlimited conducted as part of our Western Abandoned Mine and Restoration Program, uh, which is American Fort Canyon outside of Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, this uh, project kicked off in 2004, so we're getting, getting back there now, um, with support from Tiffany and Company Foundation. Um, and this is the Pacific Mine, again, in American Fort Canyon. Uh, this project was the first voluntary nonprofit-led abandoned hard rock mine restoration project in the West. Um, and as a non-liable third-party Good Samaritan organization, we negotiated with the EPA a uh, agreement on consent that limited liability under uh, CERCLA for this project. Um, you know, importantly, it was uh, there wasn't a draining mine at it, so we didn't have a point source of pollution that implicated the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System, which is something I can talk about um, a little bit later. Um, but this, this agreement served as a model for further uh, voluntary cleanup efforts from on, uh, primarily on private land. Um, and it helped lead to the development of the, the EPA's administrative tools for Good Samaritan, which essentially settlement agreements that um, provide a level of limited liability protection to conduct projects like this, what we call dry site projects that don't have that draining abandoned mine added component to them. Uh, next slide. So uh, more recently, um, the Akron Mine and Mill site, uh, which is a large scale ab abandoned mine land reclamation project conducted in 2016 near White Pine, Colorado. You, know, you can see the before and after, the before on the left there um, with the uh, con um, contaminated tailings piles with lead and other heavy metals. You, know, you can imagine a precipitation event um, washing um, that uh, mine waste into uh, into the stream there, which is Tomichi Creek. Um, and this project, uh, upon completion, and you can see the after photo on the right, um, you know, focused on relocating and consolidating those uh, tailings and waste materials that reached, uh, you know, 50 feet above the creek. Um, as well as, um, you know, restoring the creek itself and reconnecting it to its floodplain. So this is a really good example of um, not only addressing the chemical uh, pollution, but also um, restoring the, 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 the ecology of the site. So restoring the site to, um, uh, you know, increasing the, the ecological function. So both the addressing the pollution side, the chemical pollution side, and the physical impacts is kind of that sweet spot. Um, but that sweet spot's not expensive or not cheap. Um, it's uh, uh, this particular project between the cost of the studies, design, um, moved a lot of material and moving material is expensive. It came to $2.4 million. So a lot of good work, but it takes a lot of money. 
Um, and this site, uh, it's important to note, was uh, conducted, uh, this project was conducted in um, collaboration with the National Forest Service. This is on the, the Grand Mesa Uncompahgre and Gunnison National Forest. And that's important because it was able to be conducted under their circle authority. And so this wasn't one of the EPA Good Samaritan um, projects through one of those settle agree settlement agreements. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we've talked a little bit about Good Sam. Um, just wanted to get into the why a little bit. Um, and the why is because, you know, the current law doesn't distinguish between those who want to clean up pollution and those who created it. And that liability extends to both owners of the site, but also operators. And if a, a, an entity who's not currently liable, volunteer, like Trout Unlimited wants to go on to one of these sites um, and clean it up, we could be considered operators and as such become liable parties um, mm -hmm. because that liability under these laws is strict and it's transferable. Um, and you know, want to be clear too that um, you know, uh, you know, you're not going to find a more ardent defender of the Clean Water Act than Trout Unlimited. The law is central to our mission um, and the uh, preservation of our our fisheries and health of our watersheds. But, but in our in ironic twist, um, this vital law also, um, because of the way that it's structured, prevents cleanups of those very same waters from happening. Um, and that's what we're trying to do with this Good Samaritan legislation is a very narrow uh, tweak to the law that would provide bona fide Good Samaritans with limited liability relief to improve um, those watershed conditions. Um, and that that liability relief would be conditional um, on, on improving the site. And if something were to happen, uh, a permit violation that were to um, leave the site in a worse condition, those liability waivers go away so that there's a very strong incentive to, to get it right right, and to do a good job and improve um, the, the health of these watersheds, even if we aren't able to meet that 100% uh, of the Clean Water Act standards. I mentioned the draining mine sites as being, um, you know, a real key issue here, and that is because, um, uh, be, because those point sources, that acid mine drainage, um, can be perpetual uh, for many types of pollution when the pollution Polluting activity stops, the pollution generation stops. For acid mine drainage, um, it's a chemical reaction. And as long as that reaction is occurring, it's generating acid mine drainage. And um, so if somebody like Trout Unlimited were to take on that liability, it's a perpetual liability situation. And it's um, not particularly, uh, um, uh, uh, it's not something that we would be able to do. Uh, so next slide, please. So I did want to touch a little bit on um, kind of reprocessing as reclamation. Um, you know, I, I do envision a future in which abandoned mine cleanups are an important part of the critical mineral puzzle. It's not a silver bullet, and I don't think there are any silver bullets with this issue, but I think we do need to seek every opportunity to prevent new, new impacts to clean water and communities. Uh, while also moving toward more secure supply chains for, you know, clean energy technologies. Um, you know, Kyle and Steve covered a number of the, um, the policy items and the steps that, you know, Steve said, whole of government approach to trying to figure this out. Um, so I won't go into those, but I do want to note that in the current um, Good Sand Bill, the Good Samaritan remedi Remediation of Abandoned Hard Rock Mines Act of 2022, a uh, good long uh, bill title, um, that there is a reprocessing uh, provision within there that would allow for reprocessing of um, some of these low risk pilot sites that would be authorized. Um, the key within this is that there's no profit motive that any proceeds off of that reprocessing have to go in to be used to pay for the project or into a fund that would be established by the legislation to reimburse um, federal agencies for um, costs uh, associated with implementing the law. So next slide, please. Um, so speaking of funding, um, you know, in, in addition to liability challenges, the other real challenge here is also uh, funding. You know, I mentioned just one project was $2.4 million that we conducted. And while the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act created a new program with a $3 billion authorization, Congress really hasn't put the money um, 
to, to back up that promise. Um, just, you know, for FY23 appropriations, the Senate proposal is $20 million for that program. And when we've done one project that was $2.4 million, and that funding um, for the new program would be split between um, federal agencies and also grants to states and tribes, you know, $20 million doesn't go very far. And if 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 the collective we want to be serious about cleaning up abandoned mines, we need to put, uh, you know, need to put put the money where our mouth is. Next slide. Um, so, you know, Debbie touched on this a little bit, but, um, you know, remining versus reclamation, uh, I think it's an important distinction, especially when considering liability waivers. Um, you know, you may have remining that has a remediation component, but maybe not the primary focus, uh, or you can have remediation with reprocessing as part of it, like what we're talking about within the context of the Good Sand Bill. Um, and at a policy level, I think that that distinction is important um, because political support varies with regard to uh, how, how and who uh, environmental li liability may be waived for. Um, but looking ahead, um, you know, I think that this is an important conversation as we look to ramp up critical minerals production and the role that a abandoned mine lands may play within that. So just the last slide, please. Uh, so just wanted to think about moving forward here and, um, you know, we recently initiated a, a plaster mine restoration project uh, along with Kinross Gold um, in Alaska along Resurrection Creek near the town of Hope. And I think that that's fitting because a lot of this work, it is about hope and it is about resurrection. Um, we're, we're literally bringing streams back to life. Um, you know, this before and after is in the Nine Mile Valley, uh, west of where I live here in Montana, I'm in Missoula. Um, and you can see the before and after photos, um, you know, pictures tell us a thousand words there. Uh, and I have hope behind the momentum that we see uh, with policy changes, both on the funding side uh, and also on the liability side that we're, after a couple of decades trying to pass Good Samaritan legislation, that we're, we're, we're not just beating our head against the wall for the same result, that we're going to get the result we desire, which is this uh, pilot program so that we can start moving forward. And if we can produce critical minerals along the way, you know, that's a win-win for uh, for communities, for the environment, and also for supply chain. So uh, thanks again. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here today and look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Corey. Uh, uh, not only for your presentation, but uh, it is a, a remarkably nice day, at least here in uh, D.C., and you were able to take us at the end of our session to the great outdoors and the greenery. Okay, I will ask um, while our uh, panel is uh, panel, while our, our uh, uh, members and guests here are coming up with questions, I have a couple from the audience. Did I just close? There we go. Uh, so uh, this is a for, for anyone on the panel, if you're aware, for um, uh, abandoned mines that are not on uh, federal land. Are any of you aware of states that have enacted Good Samaritan laws for, for non-federal land? Uh, and uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll, uh, this is a, a two-parter. Uh, that and uh, this specifically for Steve, part two, is the interagency working group looking at other county, other countries' mining laws uh, and how remediation and remining were handled there? Sure. Well, why don't I take number two first, and then we can go back to that, that state one, because I don't have a great answer for that. But um, on the international question, yes, we are uh, very closely looking at other countries' mining laws and regulations and, and outreach policies. Uh, Canada and Australia are just two uh, that we're particularly focusing on, but uh, we have the State Department involved in our working group, and we have a, a sub-working group that's specifically focused on looking at international policies and international best practices, and also a lot of the international standards that are out there like IRMA and ICMM and, and so on to, to see how those compare with um, US uh, operations. Thanks, so does any, is anyone aware of uh, state level good SAM laws? Um, not necessarily good SAM laws per se, but here again in Nevada, there's a very robust uh, program to secure hazardous mine openings. And when you locate a claim here in Nevada, which would be on federal land, of course, you pay a fee that goes to the Division of Minerals and they use that fee to help fund their um, hazard abatement program. 
And that that program is kind of blind to land status, which is an important element here. You know, the environmental problems or safety hazards that exist at these sites, um, they, they don't fit neatly into a land status. And so you can't, in many cases, you can't solve a problem without tackling that complex land status issue that might involve federal land as well as private land. I will say um, on the hard rock side, I think California has sort of has an old hard rock Good Samaritan program. On the, on the coal side, Pennsylvania does have a, a state law and it's helpful and try to limit it. We have our hard rock side. We also have uh, a side of the organization that works on coal mine reclamation as well. But at the end of the day, that point source discharge um, uh, Clean Water Act conundrum that I described uh, has to be addressed through federal legislation. Thanks, uh, and Corey, since uh, while I have you, um, uh, there's a question, how much stakeholder engagement uh, does Charter Limited do prior to beginning a reclamation project? Uh, and maybe uh, if it's easier, just uh, how do you go about doing your stakeholder engagement? Yeah, um, you know, importantly, we are, you know, involved, I mentioned we have uh, almost 400 chapters throughout the country in local communities. So we have that local presence uh, in many of these places. It depends on the project. If it's a project conducted on their circle authority through, um, you know, one of the uh, uh, agreements with the EPA, you know, there's um, community engagement requirements uh, under um, circular regulations. So, um, you know, of course, follow all those laws. If it's a project conducted with a federal land management agency, uh, you know, where NEPA may apply to it, um, all of the community engagement requirements associated with that legislation. Um, and then, you know, again, it, it depends on each uh, particular project, but it, with local communities, landowners, um, other uh, non-governmental agencies, tribal nations who may have an interest in the area. It really depends, but all of that engagement is important at the beginning of the project to make sure that it's a success at the end. Thank you. Uh, for for anyone who cares to tackle it, uh, is anyone aware, uh, are there government funding, uh, is, is there any government funding or tax credits specifically for processing facilities and to that, I will add, is anyone aware of uh, DOD uh, uh, either funding or other investments along those lines, whether it's from uh, DARPA, uh, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or uh, Defense Threat Reduction Agency, or another agency for processing facilities? Um, I'm happy to try to take part of that question. Uh, it seems to me that I haven't studied the advanced manufacturing tax credit closely, but I think it would, I think there's sort of a question about whether it would cover processing because it seems to be about production of critical minerals and processing seems to be a little bit on the other end of that. Um, but I think there's an interesting question about whether the tax credit could go to a processing facility. It seems to me that the Department of Defense funding, uh, I think certainly could go to processing facilities. It's pretty broad. And I believe it's possible the Department of Defense has already provided some support for a processing operation. Um, so that, that would be my initial take on those questions. Again, without further study, uh, I think you'd have to look a little bit more closely. Thank you. Uh, for anyone who wants to tackle it, can indigenous, can indigenous nations develop and implement good SAM type laws? And if so, uh, have any that we're aware of? I'm not aware of any, um, but some of the liability hurdles that like an organization like Trout Unlimited or even state agencies, for instance, as a person under the Clean Water Act, um, don't apply to tribal nations uh, due to you know sovereign immunity. Um, there's a little bit of a question of uh, how the Clean Water Act um, treats, uh, you know, the definition of a person uh, to include tribes and what congressional intent is on that. But in terms of conducting projects, um, 
you know, good example is the Navajo Nation, who has a very robust uh, program remediating uranium mines. So um, can't really speak to if there's um, uh, uh, laws, but certainly conducting um, abandoned mine land restoration projects. Um, you know, tribes like uh, the Navajo Nation uh, do a lot of that great work. Thanks. Uh, we'll ask Debbie to start on this, but anyone else is welcome to jump in. Uh, going back to some of what you presented, uh, are there any uh, specifics on how a permit could be streamlined while not also affecting the quality of the environmental impact analysis? Uh, and part two of that, are there examples of uh, successful, sorry, yeah, successful examples of incremental cleanup projects? Well, I think potentially Corey just gave us some examples of successful incremental cleanup projects. And I, I must say, Corey, it's 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 really heartening to see those before and after pictures because you know what you have been able to achieve within the confines of the very complex legal and regulatory issues is is great. Um, and again, you know, we should have as the objective broadly support for projects that improve the environment as opposed to something that just tries to completely address all of the projects. And I think that is, or all of the problems, I think that is especially true for a public sector entity who is willing to take on the remediation um, activity. Um, you know, if you have a, a, a private sector endeavor there obviously they're gonna be held to some pretty stringent standards and that's fine. I think McKinsey's uh, example of what they are doing at Stibnite um, shows that you know that's that can be done. Um, on the streamlining piece of it, I believe that probably one of the best things we could do is to establish some uh, timelines for a completion of the NEPA process. It's mainly the NEPA process that is the um, rate limiting factor for most projects. And, you know, there was, um, you know, there've been suggestions in the uh, previous administration to establish time limits to complete NEPA documents. Uh, that, would, that would mean a tremendous amount. Now, that's not to say that a streamlined structure uh, or timeline to complete a NEPA document has any shortcuts in it because, um, I mean, here in Nevada, we follow a process where the BLM um, really scrutinizes a project and the sufficiency of the baseline studies very, very closely before they even initiate the NEPA process. So, you know, the burden of proof and the amount of environmental planning and engineering design that has to go into a project, that can happen. And then you start the NEPA process and uh, um, some Establish well established timeframes for completion of that NEPA process would be very helpful. Thanks. Anyone else want to uh, jump in on that before we move to the next? Jeff, um, I wanted to just point out I, I put in the chat a link to a DOD investment in a process in, in a facility that's doing going to do processing. I was going to thank you for that. Yeah, that, and that's uh, for uh, DOD, uh, $35 million for uh, heavy earth uh, separation at the uh, at the Mountain Pass. Uh, Mountain Pass, yeah. Okay. Uh, do we have any questions from our board members or anything else from the audience? Jeff, I noticed there was a question in the chat about uh, my views on the um, mining law of 1872 and whether or not it should be changed. And maybe I could take just a minute to clarify that a little bit. So as I mentioned, the mining law of 1872 governs land tenure. And yeah, it it's old, but it, it's been amended many times. As Steve mentioned, uh, there have been various minerals like oil and gas and coal that were removed from the jurisdiction of the mining law. Perhaps one of the most significant amendments occurred in 1976 when Congress enacted the Federal Land Management Policy Act that includes a very specific directive that um, endeavors on public lands, and it's not just true of mining, but, but all projects on public land, 
must prevent unnecessary or undue degradation. And the BLM's regulations that implement that um, unnecessary or undue degradation mandate in FLIPMA are really a, a very, very effective way to implement that environmental protection mandate because they define, those regulations define UUD as you have to comply with all applicable state and federal regulations. And so that regulation is a very dynamic standard. And it means that as a new regulation is enacted by Congress or amended by Congress, that automatically is applicable to a mining project. So, um, you know, you, you often hear critics say that, oh, the 1872 mining law doesn't include any environmental provisions. That's just not true. Um, because mines, like any other industry, are carefully regulated by all of the federal environmental protection laws that we have. I mean, certainly there's no ali ali oxen free in the Clean Water Act for mining projects. So I just wanted to try to clarify um, that the mining law does deal with environmental protection, and through FLIPMA and the implementation of FLIPMA, um, has very robust and effective environmental protection requirements. At great risk of extending this for another hour and a half, does anyone uh, else uh, on the panel wish to comment on the mining law of 1872? Thank you for the just that there's <laughs> At the risk of extending it, no, just um, at least from Chad Lemon's perspective, really look at 1872 mining law, two pieces to it, one, the permitting side, but then also uh, you know, the royalty side and, and look at, is there a type of fair royalty fee structure um, that could be implemented that could then go in to help fund this huge, um, you know, backlog of abandoned mine land programs that are out there. And so in terms of the policy discussion around the 1872 mining law, I think both of those are important. Corey, thanks for raising that. I mean, the industry has been at the table for three decades, basically, saying that it is yeah. willing to pay a fair royalty. And there's a lot of argument over what that fair royalty should be. Um, I'd like to suggest that there's another more achievable um, possibility here, which is the claims maintenance fee that you pay, that miners have to pay every year per claim, generates quite a bit of money. I mean, last year it was on the order, I wanna say I'm doing this by memory, but I believe it was on the order of about a hundred million dollars. Mm -hmm. Right now, that money just vanishes into the ether of the treasury. There's, it's not, you know, it's not earmarked for anything in particular. Congress could direct that those funds or some portion of the funds, the, some of the funds are used to run the, be administer the BLM's mining law program. But the amount that isn't needed to administer the program, and, you know, that has been on the order of, you know, 40, 45 million dollars per year, could be earmarked for an AML fund. And that would be a viable start. You know, if you had, say, $60 million a year to go into a reclamation, an AML reclamation fund, um, pretty soon you're talking about real money after several years. So that is what I would consider some real low hanging fruit as a policy matter that Congress could achieve that would start funding AML, hard rock AML reclamation programs. Steve. Yeah. Thanks, Debbie. And I'll, I'll just say um, we, we got that comment from quite a number of uh, organizations, you know, looking at that, you know, potential source of revenue. Um, I'll wait until our recommendations come out to, um, you know, to make any bigger picture comments about the mining law. Uh, I'll just say, though, um, while it does fund the BLM uh, mining law program, it does not fund anything in the Forest mm -hmm. Service right now. So that's also another potential need for funding because they also like uh, pretty much all of our federal agencies are kind of starved for, you know, the, it seems like we're getting, uh, there's a good amount of revenue coming in through things like the IRA and the bipartisan infrastructure law. And uh, a lot of that is, you know, incentivizing a lot of this activity out there, but we're not seeing the same kind of increases to the permitting budgets for yeah. these agencies that are now going to be seeing a lot of the increased activity that some of these bills are going to drive. So um, that's that's just an ongoing concern of ours. Well, well. the industry shares that concern. And, and I believe the, uh, the previous panel discussed that. 
part of the issue with it takes so long to permit a mine is simply staffing shortages at the agencies. And so that needs to be part of the equation that you have a larger cadre of mining professionals in both the Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management who can respond to permits. Um, so yeah, thanks for raising that. I think that's an, another important piece of the puzzle. I will thank you all. Uh, that's uh, I you know I was trying to decide do we get into 1872 law and that was that was worth it. Um, so thank you all very much, uh, both our audience participants and our our panelists for for taking time and effort to put that together and field all the questions. Uh, we greatly appreciate it, and I'm going to turn it over to Jim to close us out. Thank you, Jeff, and and. Uh... So, um, so I'm on for a little wrap up and summary, but I, what I'm not gonna do is try to recap because I couldn't recap this day. Um, I, think, uh, I think we'll leave it to folks to, uh, to tune on and, and watch the webinars, but I do have a couple recap comments and I thought maybe I always kind of think what I'm presenting is what are the three points? So I tried to think in terms of threes for the panel. And so maybe I'll just do that as a, a sense of summary. So, so first, I, I think we identified that we're going to have high min, high demand growth in minerals. There's high demand uncertainty and maybe uncertainty of timing of demand. That was two. And three, there's going to be challenges, and those may be in the difficult to quantify variables, uh, particularly the social license, national security, supply chain kind of issues. Then the second group is, is, um, uh, is that there's a lot of opportunity in remining and it can meet a part of, part of our demand. There's still is chat, there's again, a set of challenges came up in economic challenges and technology challenge, the economics of, of remining. And then there's risk and a whole number of risks, uh, legal, economic, regulatory permitting, public acceptance, expertise, workforce. So those all fit into a risk category. And third, we heard a lot of issues around policy and, and some of those involve some of the issues, concerns, opportunities because of, of funding with new, new laws. So there's money. Uh, that the federal government is updating, uh, working very diligently uh, to update mining policy and regulatory practices. And third, there is uh, there's uh, uh, tens of thousands of sites that require work, might have opportunity. And I would sum up that third one on Good Samaritan is, is that we continue to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. So now, the last thing, or, or, or please forgive me, but it, it, I'm going to infuse a little bit of my thoughts. So these aren't necessarily any board things as well. But so I think on on capturing the whole day, uh, mineral demand will increase. The question is, will it be large or will it be larger? Um, the world is likely to struggle to meet demand for many of these for the minerals that we have. And addressing social issues, and forgive me for reusing this word, may be the critical path and the critical constraint. Um, we heard something that said uh, that was a quote was that that an energy transmission may be a transition from fuel intensity to mineral intensity, and maybe maybe it's actually perhaps it's a fuel and mineral intensity transition. Um, I'm not sure I see any projection that our energy demands go down in the next 30 years. So I think, I think we have to think about both. I found it real interesting, some of the discussion about the, the funding that's available in these, um, uh, in, in the, um, in the, the, the um, Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Uh, and part of that, it reminded me of my days a while back when I used to manage research. And one of my favorite 
activities in our annual planning is we would pick certain of the programs and we said, pretend that you have no budget constraints. <laughs> How would you change your your planning and assume no budget constraints and and tell us how you can deliver that and we quickly would find in those exercises that the funding was not the time constraint in most technology research it it was a pro they are, you know a has to be done before b and and you could change what you could change is the uh, the risk profile of being successful with more funding, but you generally shortening the, and you could shorten the time frame a little bit, but you couldn't, uh, it was surprising. So what the question I come up with is what are the non-monetary constraints that we should be focusing on? Because we now we have a lot of money that's going into these these issues. So that's, that's a question that I, I think we would well, to look at and um, and so my um, my 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 final three before I wrap up is this is highly complex and and when we think about the complexity is critical minerals mining processing supply chains the complexity of just that piece is daunting so when we then fold that into an energy transition, and this is one of many complex pieces that it perhaps cries out that we need to think, when we think about energy transitions, we should think in a broader systems approach and how we think about all how all these pieces fit together. And, um, and that goes back to some of my initial opening marks on and how do we fit those time frames, time pieces together? So with that, I'll, I'll uh, before I turn it back to Isabel, this the these there's lots of opportunities for the board and for the committee on resources and probably some other parts of the national academies to work on this. And I would be remiss as chair of the committee on earth resources if I did not remind you that on November 16th, the future of mining. And we would encourage you to, to tune in for that. And, and uh, with that shameless plug, I turn it back over to Isabel. All right, thank you. And as someone who cares about Earth Systems approaches, uh, amen. <laughs> All right, um, let me get rid of this. So uh, of course, I would just like to conclude by expressing our appreciation to all of those uh, online, our speakers in particular, our moderators, um, and, and those in the room. I'd also like to thank each of you for joining us, uh, contributing your great questions. As a reminder, the video for this uh, meeting will be available at our website, I hear immediately after we sign off. So effectively in the next few minutes. Um, and we would just like to say, have a good rest of your day or evening, wherever that might be. Thank you.